This was back in my single mom, online dating days, good old 2016. I came across a decent looking guy on Plenty of Fish who lived in my hometown. I did all the right things, googled him, checked his social media, chatted for a few weeks before meeting, and then met in public. The guy, I'll call him Mike, seemed very nice, even bought a small toy for my toddler son. There just wasn't really a romantic connection. We both agreed that being friends was a better idea and carried on chatting through text. I continued my pursuit of a relationship and my friendship with Mike for probably a few weeks when a family friend called my mother frantically about a post she had seen on Craigslist about me. What I found seemed innocent enough, a stranger professing their desire to help me I was a single mom working at a fast food drive through so it was no secret that I'm struggling financially. I found it more funny than anything, but was also curious. My Craigslist admirer turned out to be a friend of my mother who had a crush on me for some years. I was only 22 at the time, and yet this isn't the creepy guy of the story. The older man admitted that he had made a post while drunk after seeing a listing by me offering sexual favors for money, pictures of my face photoshopped onto nude bodies, my real name, my workplace, and the fact that I was a single mom living alone, all listed in an ad offering sexual favors for money. I was mortified. Luckily, the post wasn't up for long after the older man reached it and took screenshots. Also luckily, the poster was stupid enough to use their real phone number and a selfie I had only sent that one person. Mike was catfishing men as me. I chewed him out and cut him off. Looking back now, I wish I would have done more and thank heavens I wasn't targeted or assaulted as a result of this disgusting creep. It's true that I lived a very sheltered life. My grandma never really trusted me to do anything on my own and could barely stand to allow me to access the outside world. She controlled my use on the internet, never allowed me to have a phone, and always tried to force me to come home straight after school. I couldn't even watch the news or read a newspaper. So it's safe to say that when I turned 18, I became a little reckless. I found sneaky ways to get around her, no internet time, by going over to my friends' houses and using their phones. Well, that's how I met Matt. Matt was a 27 year old man. Needless to say, I started to develop feelings for Matt and thought he had feelings for me, though now I see I was wrong. He knew from stories how controlling my grandmother was and wanted to help you experience all that life has to offer. I agreed to wanting to experience what he had to teach me. At the time, I was working as a janitor and had a steady income. One of the things I asked Matt to do was to buy me alcohol, and I offered to pay for it. He happily agreed and told me to meet him two cities over, so I did, and the first thing we did when we met up was go to buy the alcohol. He brought me back to his place and introduced me to his friends, Taylor and Sarah, a married couple. So the four of us began drinking, and it didn't take long for Tyler and Matt to get smashed. I was taking it slow due to it being my first time drinking, though that didn't stop Matt from trying to force more alcohol down my throat. When it got close to being dark, Matt and Tyler had gotten into a fight. To this day, I can't remember what they were fighting about. It had gotten so bad that Tyler started beating the crap out of Matt. I had never seen two people actually fist fighting before and was unsure how to stop it. Sarah and I just kept yelling at them to stop. Eventually, the fight made its way outside and Tyler had Matt laying on the grass while he was punching him over and over again. Suddenly, Matt's grandfather showed up. He lived just down the road. Matt's grandfather yelled at Tyler, telling him that he called the cops and Tyler stopped punching Matt. Tyler walked over to Matt's grandfather and demanded his car keys from him. Matt's grandfather refused and Tyler forced the keys out of his hand. Tyler ran over to the truck and gets in, just as the cops show up. Tyler freaks out and floors it out of the driveway. 
The cops blocked his way, and Tyler decided to drive up onto the driveway of the people across the street, slamming full force into the boat that the neighbor was working on. Thankfully, the neighbor was quick enough to get out of the way. The cops pulled Tyler out of the car and arrested him. Matt went to the hospital, and Matt's grandfather looked after me, asking me to stay until Matt got back from the hospital. I agreed, wanting to make sure that Matt was okay. It had gotten late by the time Matt got back. He told me that I was just going to stay the night. I tried to protest, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. That should have been a red flag for me, but I ignored it. I ended up spending the night on his couch. The next day, Matt took me to the bus station and sent me home. I thought that I would never see Matt again, till one day he contacted me. I could only use email as a form of communication due to having no phone. He invited me to a party. I was excited to go and said yes. He asked me for my address and I gave it to him. Later that night, he came in and picked me up. First thing he asked me is if I could help him by giving him money for alcohol. I agreed and gave him some money. We went to go pick up some drinks. We then started to drive to where the party was. I kept trying to ask him where we were going because he seemed to keep driving further and further away from the city. He kept saying, it's a surprise, don't worry baby, I'll take good care of you. He grabbed my knee and roughly squeezed it, red flag number two. He kept driving and the houses kept getting more and more spread out. Why are we going so far out? We're going to a friend's place. Don't worry, they throw parties all the time. We finally made it to the house. I got gotten really nervous now because it was only house for miles around. We get out of the car and go in. When I enter, I see Sarah is there. I also see Tyler is there. I gave him a look and he said, Don't worry, girly. We made amends. I looked around and there was no one else there. Where are the owners of the house? Well, they aren't actually here, but they said we could throw a party. They are out of town for a few weeks. Matt said, shoving a strong drink in my hands. Red flag number three. Feeling uncomfortable, I said, I don't really feel like this is the right thing to do. Matt only laughed and told me to start drinking. That feeling will go away when you're buzzed. When I hesitated, he walked up to me and put the cup to my lips, forcing me to take a drink. I coughed at how strong the drink was, and everyone laughed and began drinking and dancing. Matt and Tyler had quickly gotten drunk, and I'm sure that Sarah was high on something because she quickly passed out on the floor. Later on in the night, I asked Matt if I could go home. He said, tomorrow baby, we are having fun tonight, come on. He grabbed me by my hands and pulled me into one of the rooms. We can sleep in here for the night. Tyler walked in just then and said, Lame, you guys are going to go to sleep right now? Matt only laughed and said, Dude, get out of here. You're cock blocking me. They both laughed and Matt tossed me onto the bed. Matt, please, I don't feel comfortable here. I want to go home. Matt got mad at the point and said, you are staying here for the night. If you don't behave yourself, I will let Tyler here use you as his own enjoyment. When I started to shake, Tyler leaned over and said, Chill out, girly. He was only joking. Matt chimes in. Was I? And they both started to laugh. After a few hours of them talking, Tyler left the room and Matt laid down. Good night, baby. He slurred and passed out. I got off the bed and walked to the bathroom. I splashed some water on my face and tried to breathe. I finally calmed down and walked back to the room and lay down on the floor. I fell asleep quickly. The next morning I get up and walk into the kitchen. Everyone is there and Matt walks up to me handing me some juice. I took a drink and gagged. Is there alcohol in this? Everyone laughed and Sarah said, it's called a screwdriver. I set the cup down. It's early. I don't want to drink. They all frowned and Matt said, I've been drinking since I got up. You told me that you would take me home today. Matt waved his hand at me and said, Tomorrow, babe. The three of them spent the rest of the day drinking and sleeping. Every once in a while, Matt would force me to chug a drink. You gotta catch up with us, baby. 
Come on, life is much better this way. I was just asking him if he could take me home, and he would just blow me off. That night, he was so drunk, and he forced me to do things I wasn't comfortable with, and in the middle of it all, he passed out. I pushed him off of me and crawled to the ground. I cried myself to sleep that night. Days 3, 4, 5, and 6 were all the same. He kept saying, Tomorrow, babe, and would force a drink down my throat. Finally, on day 7, the owners of the house came home. They didn't seem worried that there were people there partying. But at least when I asked them to take me home, they were more than happy to do so. Though Matt threw a fit and told them that I was joking. I had to wait until Matt drank himself to sleep to ask again to be taken home. I begged them to take me home and told them that I wasn't happy there and how long I'd been there. They seemed surprised and quickly got me out of the house. They dropped me off in my city. I took the bus home and locked myself in my room for an entire week and never told anyone what happened for fear that Matt would hurt me for telling anyone or for the fear that no one in my life would believe me. To this day, at the age of 27, I still can't deal with driving in more rural areas in my state. Sure, I could have just walked away from the house at any point, but I was taken to a house in the pitch black and had no idea where I was. I tried to use Matt's phone to call someone to come pick me up, but his phone was always locked. I thought about calling the cops, but I didn't have the address and was scared that the cops would put me in jail for drinking underage. I didn't want my life to be ruined over this. I was also scared that if Matt woke up and saw me holding his phone, that he would hurt me. I was scared the whole time and always had alcohol in my system, so my thoughts weren't always clear. I was also sleep deprived as I was trying to sleep on the floor for days on end and if I tried to sleep any time that they were awake, they would wake me back up. I admit that they were all very creepy and refused to even listen to how I felt. Thankfully though, I was able to get out and I never saw them again. From that point on, I was very careful not to trust people so easily. When I was in ninth grade, everyone around me was getting a boyfriend, so I wanted one too, and see what the hype actually was. I look like a nerd, which I still am, and openly embrace it now. No guy in my school would look at me that way. This was about eight years ago, and I had just started using Facebook. A guy approached me, who was four years older than me, and said that he used to be in my school, but then changed schools which I really doubt now, as he knew nothing about my school and used to give me stupid excuses whenever I asked him something. I just wanted to experience what having a boyfriend felt like, so when he proposed, I said yes, when we hadn't even met. He used to make sexual remarks now and then, which I ignored. He had asked me many times to meet, but I couldn't really come up with an excuse to give at home, so we never met. About 9 months into our virtual relationship, I got a big crush on someone from my school, so I decided to end things with him. He tried to talk me out of it and meet up at least once, but I said no. Fast forward 5 years, he tried contacting me again to meet him the next day. I was in my second year of college and he believed that he could talk me into it again. As always, I refused. A few months back, I realized this person was probably a pedophile, as I was 14 when he was trying to get with me, and he was over 18, so I wanted to confront him. So I texted him straight away and asked. All he said was, I still have your number saved, baby. I immediately blocked him. In all those years, he tried contacting many girls from my school, some of the mutual friends on Facebook and other places. To the guy I feel was a pedophile and never met, let's not meet ever. A few days ago, I put my electric drums up for sale on Craigslist as I moved to a new apartment and unfortunately had no room for them. Within minutes of posting my ad, I got a response. Their English wasn't terrible, but it clearly wasn't their first language. 
They offered to pay me the full 200 I was asking for and the extra 100 for no reason. They said movers will come pick them up on Friday and that a check, which included the money and movers fee, would be within one or two business days this Sunday night. They asked me to take down the ad immediately. Obviously, I thought the buyer was local, so I offered to drive it in my pickup truck, but they completely ignored it, saying that they would have it picked up, without thank yous or anything. The person spoke very blandly, with almost no personality. I started to get suspicious, but I'm a little bit behind on cash and need to get these drums sold, so I wanted to see what would happen. I thought, maybe I was just being paranoid. However, that's where things start to get weird. This morning, they text me with the shipping code so that I could keep track of it. A few hours later, they text me and checked if it had arrived in the mail. It's worth noting at this point that whenever I didn't respond to them within minutes, they text me asking where I was. Another thing they do is say things like, Kindly notify me when you receive the check and kindly deposit the check. They said kindly in almost every text. It was like they needed to know where I did everything and didn't want to seem forceful or off-putting, but it did. Well, I went to go get the check this evening and when I opened it, it was worth $2,550. I was stunned. Why were they paying that much? I then realized the shipping address was to Cobb, Wisconsin. Over $2,000 in mover fees. Why wouldn't they just buy local? All the red flags are piling up and at this point, alarm bells are blaring in my head. I really don't think that I'm being paranoid anymore. Something is very fishy. I try to check the place out, and from what I could tell, they buy, manufacture, and sell farm and industrial equipment. Why do they buy an electric drums? That's the final red flag. I text them that I burnt the check over the sink, which I did after taking a pic, and I'm gonna block them and pretend that this never happened. I hope that was the right thing to do. What do you think? This is not the scariest story, but it definitely creeped me the fuck out. For background, I'm a 20 year old female. I matched with this guy on Tinder a while back. His name was Nick and he seemed pretty cool, so I gave him my Snapchat. We talked a little bit, but it died out quickly. I didn't tell him my exact town I lived in, but the city about 10 minutes away because it's decent sized and has a big population. I figured he wouldn't be able to find me by just knowing that little bit of information. A few weeks ago he started messaging me and we made small talk. Everything seemed normal for a while up until New Year's Eve. The day before he messaged me saying he was going to be in my area, the city I told him I was from and asked if I wanted to meet for lunch. I told him possibly, and that I would let him know. The next night, I had a New Year's Eve party with a small group of friends. I spent most of the day getting ready and was not looking at my phone. At 7.30, I finally looked at Snapchat and saw that Nick had not only messaged me, but also called me. Hey, I'm in your city. I responded, telling him I'm sorry that I just saw the message. He opened it up within minutes and totally freaked out. He said something along the lines of, Just to let you know, I'm not really interested in someone who can't answer their phone when I drive six hours just to see her. I looked at it in disbelief and for a second, I thought he was joking. I responded by asking what he was talking about and that he didn't drive six hours just to see me. He said that we had plans and why else would he have driven up there? I was confused because we never had plans. He told me that he was going to be in my area, which made me think he was here for work or to visit a friend. It's not uncommon for people to travel here for work. I explained this to him and that we did not have plans and I did not ask him to drive all this way for me. He told me that he sat around for two hours waiting for me and bought me flowers. Again, I was confused because we never planned a time or place to meet and had never confirmed plans. You don't just make plans by just telling someone that you're gonna be in their area. He just told me to make it up to him and that I had to drive up to see him tomorrow. Yeah, fuck that. 
I remember that I had my location shared on Snapchat so he could have easily shown up at my house. I turned off my location but kept him on Snapchat in case he tries to show up at my house. Luckily, I have not heard from him since. My dad is a retired police officer and has a gun and I'm not afraid to use it. So Tinder creep who drove six hours for me, let's not meet. We all make dumb decisions in life, but in this case, I was stupid, very stupid. I arranged to meet this guy off Tinder, but because of my heightened anxiety about driving, I arranged for him to pick me up outside my place. I had been talking to him for a few weeks at least, but that's not redeemable, and I know that. The choice I made on this day could have ended me, but thankfully, I'm still around to tell this tale. The guy picked me up in his car and told me he planned to take us out for sushi. I love sushi, so I thought, great. He puts the name of the restaurant into his GPS and we were off, making pleasant conversation on the way there until I started seeing woods when I looked out my window. I felt very confused. We were supposed to be going into town, not into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. Fear hit me hard then. He said, I swear the GPS is taking me through here. I didn't choose this path. Please just take us back to civilization, I said. My eyes were wide and I must have looked like a deer in headlights. His face was really apprehensive, so he must have known that I was scared completely shitless. Oh my god, I thought to myself. I should have conquered my anxiety about driving and met him somewhere in public, or better yet, not met this guy at all. What the fuck was I thinking? I'm gonna get murdered here in these woods. I tried checking my phone to see if I could assist him with GPS and that's when he said those spine chilling words. There's no signal out here. I remember just thinking to myself to try to look calm. Don't let him know that you suspect he's onto something. But man, did I feel terrified. The tips of my fingers were cold while I was simultaneously sweating. If he's going to kill me, part of me wanted him to get it over with so I wouldn't be left in anticipation. His forehead was perspiring. He kept saying, I swear I'm not doing this. I'm trying to get us back on route to the sushi place. I said, I don't care about sushi anymore. Get us to a gas station. Anywhere with people at this point. He said, I don't have a shovel or a weapon in my trunk or anything if that's what you're thinking which did little to calm my nerves. We finally reached the restaurant after what felt like an eternity. I'd never been so scared in my life. I didn't have much of an appetite and I was physically trembling when we arrived. I figured he didn't kill me when he had a chance, so I guess it's safe now to continue with our date. I already planned on taking an Uber home because I didn't want to go through that experience again. I was shocked out of my mind when he said, So when do you think we'll have sex? I nearly choked on a piece of sashimi. What? I didn't know where this was coming from and didn't know how he could ask me something like this now on our first date when he literally made me go pale as a ghost just moments ago. You know, like how long will you make me wait for sex? A day? A week? A month? I stared at him dumbfounded. I couldn't respond because I was utterly speechless in that moment. Well, I can't take a whole month. I'm telling you now, he said. I didn't say anything and the rest of the date was insanely awkward. I said goodbye and I took an Uber home and only seconds after the driver pulled out of the restaurant parking lot, he texted me to say that he doesn't think it will work out with me because he needs a girl with a higher libido. I didn't argue. I just text back a simple... Okay, ready to be done with this man. When the Uber driver drove me home, he did not take me through the same wilderness path of the potential murder site. He took me home through streets, other cars, lights, the sweetest scene to my immense relief. I couldn't help but wonder why my date had to take me through an hour drive through the wilderness to get to the restaurant, but it only took the Uber driver 15 minutes to get me home from the same location the whole thing was chilling and I don't know if my date planned on anything sinister or if it was an honest mistake 
but I'm glad I made it out alive. I learned a tough lesson that night, one that I should have already known, but I foolishly ignored for some reason. Don't let strangers from dating apps pick you up in their cars. To the guy that took me through the woods, let's not meet again. Back in my single days, I often tried online dating apps. I talked with this one guy in particular. For the sake of the story, I'll call him Tom. Tom and I started chatting after we matched, and it went well, so we progressed to talking over the phone. He had a nice voice, and I liked that he could carry on a conversation, because I always feel sort of awkward with talking to people, and have a problem of running out of things to say. My mind will draw a complete blank when I'm nervous, so having him talking to me on the other end of the line was a nice relief. After some successful conversations, we went on a couple dates in person that were surprisingly very pleasant. We met up at public venues, a couple of restaurants. We both had a background in English, and he was also a writer like me, so it was nice to have those interests in common. Our conversations were easy, in-depth, with a nice flow. I invited him to a function in my community where he introduced himself to my neighbors, friends, and family. They all kind of looked at me like, is this your new boyfriend? Raising their eyebrow. I told them though that we were just friends who were still getting to know each other. It felt too soon for me to call him my boyfriend. But Tom said something different, telling everyone that I was in fact his girlfriend. I had to keep correcting him. I felt a little embarrassed and I regretted bringing him to the gathering. Overall, we only really dated, I use that term lightly, for about three weeks before things started to get really weird. Tom was increasing his number of text messages and wanting to spend a lot more time with me, asking to see me almost every single day. At first, I thought it was flattering, I enjoyed attention, and the feeling of being wanted. But at some point, I'm not exactly sure when, it escalated to a really uncomfortable level. I remember just feeling smothered. He would blow up my phone, ask me what I'm doing, but it didn't seem like a normal, how are you, kind of way. There was a controlling undertone to the question. When I answered, he'd want to know details about where I was, what I was doing, what time I was doing it at, etc. I considered that maybe he was just feeling insecure and that he would calm down with some time. Our next big outing, I met up with him and my friend so we could go out to a bar and hang out. At some point though, my friend wanted to leave because she wasn't feeling good. We said goodbye to Tom and I left the bar to take her home. When I checked my phone after arriving home late that same night, I saw I had a bunch of angry text messages from him. Why didn't you kiss me goodbye? You don't really like me, do you? I wrote back saying, I just had to take my friend home. I didn't know I was supposed to kiss you. Kissing shouldn't be an obligation. Sorry, I just didn't think about it because I was occupied. Can we let this go? I am tired and I want to go to bed now. He said, Okay, you're right. I'm sorry. Please don't ghost me, okay? Or something along those lines. I didn't know why, but I felt really weird and that he was just too clingy and it worsened from here. Moving forward, whenever I talked to him, it seemed like he would deliberately try to initiate an argument or a fight. I'm not the confrontational type, and this was incredibly energy draining for me to keep up with. Why does everything have to be an argument? I asked him. He explained how he grew up in an abusive household, and he was used to members of his family arguing all the time. This felt normal to him. So I explained, well I'm not used to that, and frankly, it's a little scary to me. People in my family talk things out calmly when we have disagreements. We don't raise our voices, jump to accusations, or have temper tantrums. You're right. But of course, this did not change. I lost the spark. The initial attraction I had for Tom was gone. I actually felt repelled by him now. I decided I just couldn't see him anymore. I felt really sad and guilty for his life situation and the way he grew up. But at the same time, the roller coaster dynamic of our communication was starting to take a toll on my mental health. 
When I broke up with him, he threatened to commit suicide. I didn't know what to do, so I asked my parents and some of my old psychology course classmates for advice. Everyone advised me that Tom's mental instability wasn't my responsibility and that he needed to go seek help. He kept flooding me with messages on all my accounts, and as mentioned before, he was a writer, so he would send beautifully written, lengthy pleas for forgiveness. I replied with, I really just need a break right now, but he ignored my wishes and kept trying. At one point, he sent me a photo of his dog, telling me his dog says, Hi, I miss you. That's when I thought, okay, this is weird and manipulative, so I'm going to block him. And I did. I blocked him on everything, phone numbers, social media accounts, etc. When he couldn't reach me, he resorted into some drastic measures. He emailed my parents. Yes, my parents. Why is he messaging us? My parents asked me. This feels weird and creepy. I don't know, I said honestly. He's pleading with us to convince you to get back with him. I don't want to get involved with this, my mom said. I don't want you to get involved either. My parents knew the whole ordeal already because I asked them for their advice when he had threatened suicide. So while having discussed about it, our consensus was to offer no response. They proceeded to block him as well. Next, it was my friend who had gone with us to a bar. Uh, Tom messaged me saying that you broke his heart or something. What happened? Did you do something to him? I broke up with him didn't respond, just blocked him. She obliged, but that wasn't the end of it. Tom reached out to my neighbors. I guess he remembered their names and memorized them all by heart. He reached out to each one of them with a lengthy, elaborate story about how we'd been together for at least six months and that we were passionately, madly in love. In the story, he portrayed himself as some kind of victim, like I was a villainess, man-eater, or something weird. I don't know because I didn't read it. What did you do to this poor guy? I kept being asked that over and over again by different neighbors. I was forced to keep repeating the explanation about what happened. We went out for only a few weeks, a month at most, I said, and advised them to please not respond or encourage him. Honestly, I'm a very private person, so having the whole community know about my situation was deeply humiliating for me. This went on for about a year. I'd have someone tell me, Tom tried to reach out to me again. There's this one older lady neighbor of mine that actually continued talking to Tom over email, even though I asked her to stop. She said, but he writes so beautifully and he's a beautiful dark soul. The whole thing put a rift between her and her husband. A separate neighbor told me that she was afraid for my personal safety she said, he seems like a stalker type, like from those crime shows, which didn't do much to help my anxiety. I spent a lot of time indoors for a while after that. I felt withdrawn, insecure, deeply embarrassed, and most of all, scared. I felt like I had to look over my shoulder whenever I stepped outside of my house. I took a long break from dating apps, feeling a bit shaken up from the whole experience. Two years later, in 2018, he texted me from a different number, saying, You know who this is? If you still don't want me back, don't respond, and I'll leave you alone forever. Even though he didn't give me his name, I knew it was Tom. Frankly, I was relieved. My first inclination was to think, I'm finally free. Thankfully, he hasn't messaged me, my friends, parents, or neighbors since. I just hope it stays that way. I'll give a little background about myself for my story. I'm a young gay man living in a medium sized city. The dating scene is rather limited and most gay people use apps or websites for meeting others for encounters or dates. I frequent websites and apps daily just to see if there's anyone new out there that I haven't already spoken to, yet I rarely actually met anyone from online. The fear of STIs or being robbed always had been in the back of my mind, so I generally browse without ever actually meeting guys. About six months ago, while browsing Craigslist, 
I found an ad that seemed to be somewhat what I was looking for. The ad was by a man a little older than myself who seemed to want the same things that I wanted. He wanted to meet up with a guy my age and get to know each other over drinks, maybe a little cuddle session, whatever else may follow, and not just a quickie kind of thing. After responding to this ad, the guy and I talked for about a month through text messages without ever making plans of meeting. I finally got the confidence and asked if he wanted to meet. He agreed and we decided that I would drive to his place, which was about 10 miles from me and out of the city limits. The day we decided to meet, it was getting late, about 6 p.m. The sun was still somewhat out, but it was getting darker. I got into my car and drove to the area where he lived. The guy texted me and said that he'd be walking on the side of the road because he was coming back from visiting a friend and just asked that I pick him up to go back to his place. He told me before that he had two kids that lived with him, but the kid's mother wasn't in the picture. He said that his kids were at a friend's house and would be back later, so we would have the place to ourselves. While making my way to this guy's house, I saw him walking on the side of the road. He was holding a large speaker and covered in a hoodie, which seemed strange because it wasn't at all cold where we live. The road we were on was very much outside the city lines on a dirt road with random trailers set up every acre or so. I stopped the car and said something friendly like, Hey stranger, need a ride? He didn't smile, he just opened the door and got into my car without saying a word. I thought that this was strange because we literally spent months having friendly chats and I just figured that he would act happy to see me, or at least not awkward about it. After picking him up and making my way to his house, he then tells me to turn around and go back to the main road. He wanted to get a blunt and some alcohol so that we could chill together. So not thinking anything was strange at this point, I agreed and headed back the other way. While I was on this long dirt road with no street lights, he mentions that the power is out at his house and asked if that would be okay with me. I was slightly thrown off by this, but I said, um, sure, as long as we have candles or some light source. He didn't say anything, he just kept looking straight ahead like I had never said anything. I thought, what about your kids? How are your children living in a house with no power? So I asked him. This is where things started to get very strange. He replied, Oh, they're staying with their mom for a while. But he had just told me a few days ago that the kids lived with him and the mother was out of the picture. Questions ran through my mind, but I didn't feel like I was in trouble yet. We arrive at the store and he gets out with his face and head covered like he was hiding from somebody. This seems strange. Then he got back into the car after making his purchase. While traveling back to his place, which was about a 15 minute drive, he then told me, I had to sling crack to get money for this so we could hang out tonight. I was very surprised and shocked when he randomly told me this. The situation was getting sketchy, so I asked if he had condoms just in case we decided to need them. He said no. So I dropped him off at another store nearby before starting our journey down the long dirt road. After inconsistent and strange behaviors coming from this guy, I really just wanted to get out of the situation as fast as I could at this point. I dropped him off at the local grocery store to pick up condoms, thinking that this could be my out. I could just drive away and block his number and be done with the situation. After he walked into the store, I was trying to figure out what to do at this point. I wanted to just drive away, but I didn't want to just leave someone stranded. I finally got the nerve to leave, but his huge speaker was sitting on my floorboard. I wanted nothing connecting me with this person and feared that he might possibly say that I stole the speaker. So I got on my car, ran to the passenger side, opened the door, started dragging out the speaker from my car when I heard, what are you doing? It was him. He was right behind me. Fear ran through my body like I had been caught stealing something or lying about a bad grade to my parents. I told him, Oh, I was just going to move this to the back seat so you'd have more room in the car. Quick save. And he seemed to have bought my horrible explanation. By now he's here, in my car, and my only out is gone. We're driving down the old dark dirt road, and all that's going through my mind is, 
How am I going to get out of here alive? I'm trying to catch him in another lie to see if this is actually happening or just my imagination, but I can't seem to get information out of him. He just sits beside me, looking straight ahead, fidgeting with something in his pockets, as though he's on a mission to complete, and I'm just there to bring him to it. After driving about 15 minutes down the dirt road, I noticed that there are no longer trailers. The road was pitch black, only lit up by my headlights. I asked him if his place was coming up, because my navigation said it should be right here, and he tells me, Oh, the address I gave you was my old business. My address doesn't show up on Google Maps for some reason. Red alert. I start panicking, just knowing that I was about to be robbed or killed in a few moments. I slowed the car down and just thought of anything that could get me out at this point. I told him that my best friend was waiting for me to get back to have drinks with her. I said I didn't realize we were driving around so much and that it would take this long. I'm not sure if he bought the excuse or not, but I told him that I would text my friend the address he gave me so she knows how long I would be out and when to expect me back for our planned night out. He seemed to trust my explanation, but was very irritated. He said to me, well, can't we just have a little car fun real quick out here? Nobody lives here, so no one will even see us. I said, no, I'm sorry. My friend is going to be pissed and she already called me when you were in the store. I told her that I'd be 30 minutes and be back in time for drinks. I was ready to abandon my car at this point if he pulled out a knife or anything other than a gun. But luckily, he just kind of huffed, got out of my car, slammed the door, and started to put his head in the window to tell me something. I quickly hit the gas and turned the wheel, leaving nothing but a smoke cloud behind me. I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror due to the darkness of the night, but I imagined he might have been flipping me off or coughing from the dust plume made by my tires. After pulling myself together and realizing that I might have been the next Oprah story, I called my friend, who wasn't waiting for me, my mom, my sister, everyone that I loved, and told them a slimmed down version of the story that took place. I teared up a little thinking that I could have almost died, but overcame that pretty quickly. When I got home that night, I decided to pull up the address he gave me, I noticed that about two miles down the road, there was one house sitting alone with no neighbors. The road was a dead end. I then used Google Street View and saw that the house was completely abandoned with no doors and dirty walls. I googled the actual address of the house and found that it had been posted for sale about five years ago and was still on the market. I'm guessing nobody wants to purchase a possible crack house. My friend told me later that they imagined that he wanted to get me into the house and do whatever he wanted, since there was no traffic that far down the road. I'm sure that it would take quite a while to find a body that went missing. After all of this, I vowed to never meet anyone from Craigslist ever again, unless it was in a police parking lot. All in all, I'm okay with what happened, but it really brought to light what could happen when you least suspect it. I just need to get this story out because it's so unbelievably surreal to me that I can't even believe it's real. So last fall, I started using dating apps seriously because I really wanted to branch out and meet new guys. I moved back home after I graduated college in May, which was still the pretty early stages of the pandemic, so I was lonely. I've only ever used Tinder, so my friend told me I should try Bumble, and at first it was fun. I matched with a few guys and they were nice, but the conversation kind of died off after a while. I didn't really form a real connection with anyone on there. One of the guys I matched with asked for my Snapchat, which I gave to him so we could talk on there. We also followed each other on Instagram. That kind of stuff is harmless to me, and I really didn't think much of it. Our conversations didn't last long, and we stopped talking after a few days. It was a little strange, and I was turned off by it. Fast forward a couple of months and I get a message from him on Instagram. He told me he unfollowed me because of my support for Joe Biden in the election and then proceeded to spam me with probably over 40 messages trying to convince me to change my views and vote for Trump. I'm a very liberal person and if I would have known he was like this, I would never have spoken to him. 
He kept telling me people had blocked him for doing this before, and to, quote, please just understand where he's coming from. His last few messages were memes to ease the tension of the one-sided conversation. He and I never even talked long enough for him to feel comfortable messaging me like this. I didn't respond. I didn't even block him. I opened the messages so he could see I saw them and then unfollowed him. The next morning I get a notification telling me this message has been unsent by the sender. For every single message. Of course I screen recorded it and sent it to my friend to tell her what happened because it was just creepy and bizarre. It was over after that though. The topic of this guy didn't come up again so I moved on. A few weeks ago I was scrolling through Facebook and saw a post from a local news station. It was shared from the town this guy was in from my state. I was about an hour away from me. It was a news article about a guy who shot and killed an 87-year-old woman who lived in his apartment complex with a semi-automatic rifle. He was trying to get the other residents out of their apartments until he was shot and killed as well by a resident in order to protect the others who lived there. As I was reading about this, the guy's name and face seemed so familiar and then it clicked. It was the same guy. I went back to the screen recording of the messages I took months ago, and they confirmed it was him. I'm not sure how to describe what my response was, but I got really sweaty. My heart was racing when I made the realization. It's extremely disturbing knowing that I spoke to this man, and even had a weird experience with him. It's been a few weeks since I found out, and I still feel weird about it. I was just reading about it again today since more details have been reported since the initial shooting. Sometimes I think about the what ifs. Like what if I had responded to his messages the way I wanted to? What if I called him a creep and a weirdo and pissed him off to the point of violence? And what if he tried to harm me? God, I hope the woman he unfairly murdered is resting in eternal peace. Thank you for listening, and be wary of people on dating apps. Against my better judgment, at the beginning of the month, I got a Tinder account. I matched with a few guys here and there, and one of them was named James. We ended up texting each other, and he seemed pretty chill and pretty into me. He's a decent-looking guy, and we seemed to click. He had apparently been in a relatively abusive relationship with a woman, and he was looking to start over. According to him, she had hit him with a frying pan and pepper sprayed him once. He kept on going about how crazy she was. All right, it happens. We went out to the movies this past Friday and I had a great time. We ended up talking for a few hours and we hit it off pretty well. I asked about his ex because I was a bit curious as to why he'd stay with someone like that. He didn't even say anything positive about her. Just that she was crazy, had mental illnesses and didn't take her meds. That kind of stuff. She had tried to baby trap him, but she had a miscarriage. He had expressed relief that she didn't end up with the kid. He said he had felt obligated to her. Again, I get that. All in all, I had a good time. This morning rolls around and he tells me that he hooked up with his ex last night, and that he was trying to work things out with her. It was mildly insulting that I lost out to an abusive ex, but whatever. I tell him it's cool. He then a few hours later messaged me saying that she was crazy, and he thought she was changing, but she wasn't. Blah, blah, blah. He kept asking if he could see me. He was very pushy about wanting to see me that day. He begged for five minutes of my time so he could explain to me. I politely told him I didn't want to be involved with someone who was clearly so hung up on his ex, and this is where it got nuts. He admitted he still was but that he wanted to see me today so I could meet her and she could determine if I was better for him than she was. That she wanted him to be happy because he and I had a connection. I flipped out after that. I told him the fact that he needed his ex to determine who was right for him was absolutely nuts and that's not what love is. I said I wanted no part of it. He started texting me after that and it was non-stop insults and incoherent shit that made no sense. She also dropped the bomb that she was his wife. I basically told her to fuck off and block the number. I then went on Tinder to message him where I called him a piece of shit 
and if he was intelligent, he should leave her and never message me again. He started to harass me, saying that I was miserable, because they have a beautiful love together, and all this crazy shit. He then went on to say, My wife knows where you work. I hope she doesn't do anything rash. I told him if that was a threat, I would gladly go to the police. He then said she's been to jail before. She's not afraid. That she loves him so much she'd mess anyone up and risk jail for him. That she'd kill my friends if they tried to protect me. That she's armed and dangerous. I told him goodbye, reported him, and then deleted my Tinder account. I did go to the police, but since it wasn't a direct threat, they can't do much. The cop thinks James was more or less full of shit and just trying to scare me since some people love getting off on that shit. He said I did the right thing by blocking him and reporting him. Then he said I should keep my eyes open and alert the people at my job. The scary thing is, James seemed perfectly normal, but he lied about being married, how he felt towards his wife, and he flipped like a switch. His excuse for not being up front and being married was that they were going to get a divorce. He seemed so docile and unassuming. The hatred and aggressive attitude was insane. I have to honestly wonder what would have happened had I gone to talk for five minutes. I'm kind of concerned since they do know where I work, but if either of them try anything, then the cops can actually nail them. What a weekend. So about three years ago, when I was 18 or so, I was using Grinder, and someone messaged me. And to keep this anonymous, we'll call him Rando. So we started talking and we asked how we were and what we were up to. The usual conversation starters. Shortly after beginning the conversation, Rando began to sound rather depressing, bemoaning about his insecurities and how everyone hates him, and occasionally talking about how he should just end himself. So, being the nice person I am, I try finding something about him I could compliment on and try to make him feel better, that kind of thing. I was determined to bring a smile at the least, and that's where things began to get heavy. Rando began deflecting my compliments, calling me a liar or a user, or saying I'm just trying to make fun of him. I tried my best to reassure him that my compliments were genuine, because I hate seeing people depressed or down. It's just in my nature to bring joy to people. Now, I have been in his shoes before with a severe insecurity thing, so I know how he felt. After he finally began to believe that my compliments were real, he began to get very attached to me. He started sending me over 20 messages at once, and if I didn't reply within 5 seconds, he'd start to be like, Oh, I guess you found someone better to talk to then. You're just like all the rest. It began to get frustrating at this point. I could have just blocked him and saved me the headache, but I have anxiety and I feared he'd turn up at my door someday and maybe do something drastic if I blocked him. He also tried sending me nudes to grab my attention when I didn't reply instantly, and it only got worse and worse from here. Eventually he told me he'd be in my town over the weekend, and began to get very pushy about meeting up somewhere and doing abject things. When I didn't reply, he flips out and started finding me on different social medias to keep tabs on me. Facebook messages, friend requests, Instagram follows, that kind of thing. I went on a night out with some friends of mine at the time, forgetting he was in town over the weekend. He saw me walking down the street and he ran up to me. He was bawling his eyes out about me trying to avoid him and he began begging for my phone number and house address and he was asking us if he could join us on our night out. And when we politely refused, he followed us further and tried forcing drinks into my hand when we got to the bar. Infuriated by how clingy he was being, I went home just to realize he got on the same bus as me and followed me back to my place before he finally disappeared. He started messaging me on Grinder about visiting me at my home sometime, or trying to find my friends to get my phone number. I finally snapped at this point and I finally blocked him. I thought that was that. I discovered that the next day he was trying to catfish me with my own pictures. He was trying to get my attention and screaming to know why I blocked him. At this point, things got way too heavy and I deleted Grinder from my phone. I changed my number and moved house just to avoid him. 
This whole experience has really put me off dating people with severe insecurities, out of fear that something like this will occur again. I've been trying to go against my nature to avoid complimenting people too much to avoid something like this happening again. And three years later, I haven't seen him since. One summer I was in law school, I was swiping through Tinder looking for someone to hang out with. I matched with this guy who seemed pretty nice and looked good. Lots of shirtless photos. He was a counselor at a local high school in the metro area. We texted for a bit talked on the phone and then decided to grab brunch the next weekend. I met him at the restaurant and we had brunch with bottomless mimosas. He was nice and funny. He made me laugh a lot. I think we both got a little tipsy. He said he was going to go to a barbecue at his friend's house after brunch and asked me to come. He seemed pretty cool and I was having a good time, so I agreed. I had to walk my dog because I hadn't anticipated being out for that long, so I told him I would meet him back at the restaurant in 30 minutes. He said he really wanted to meet my dog and asked if he could join. I thought about it for a second, but my place was a total disaster, so I told him no. After that, I joined him back at the restaurant. We grabbed an Uber to his friend's house. There were a bunch of people drinking and talking. Everyone was nice. They had the barbecue situation going on out in the back. We talked to some people, hung out, drank. He started to get drunk and handsy, so I told him I wanted a drink and walked to the kitchen for space. A couple of minutes later, he comes into the kitchen and tries to kiss me. I kind of smiled and shrugged my way out of his grasp. I told him I needed to go to the bathroom. I asked him to grab me a drink and meet me outside in the backyard. When I left the bathroom, I walked straight out of the front door, two blocks down, and took a ride. I grabbed an Uber home and started getting calls and messages but I blocked him. He tried to reach out over social media, but I just blocked him there too. I honestly totally forgot about him. Fast forward three years. I'm sitting on my couch reading through the local news on my phone. I see a picture of this guy's face. He'd been arrested for assaulting women he met on Tinder. Using a throwaway account, so if my stalker is reading this, he doesn't get any insight into my current life from my usual Reddit activity. Yeah, I'm that paranoid. It's been a very long story, but I feel like I'm doing myself a disservice if I don't write things out from the beginning. I wanted to write about this for a long time. It's such a nuisance of a situation, and it seems like any time I find some semblance of mental peace, this shit comes out of the woodwork to make sure I still remember he's out there. This guy, let's call him Marvin, was in my circle of friends for a bit in high school and my early college years. Late 2000s onward, he dated a good friend of mine, Alice, and we hung out both with her and with other friends. Sometimes we would smoke together but he and I weren't really close. He had an odd sense of humor, but I was kind of oblivious to the darker aspects of his personality till he cheated on my friend at a party, according to his close friends, and lied about it. I was protective with my friend, and while I never interfered in their relationships, when my friend asked me for input, I told her she deserved better than to be lied to. To be clear, even his friend said this to her, but she continued seeing him as friends with benefits. We even hung out together in groups, but she mentioned to me many times that he's manipulative. Besides the cheating incident, she told me other instances of him acting callously. Once when he was walking with Alice and her best friend, who he didn't like because he thought she was ugly, they dropped off Alice and instead of walking her friend home, it was dark out. He ditched her without saying anything. He had a tendency to make silly homoerotic jokes, and this wasn't uncommon with the guys I knew at the time. He had gay friends and didn't have an issue with them publicly. But I remember once, this gay kid had a crush on him and was sending flirtatious comments on MySpace. Instead of just telling him that he's not interested, not actually gay, he flipped out called him a slur and viciously insults him in a tirade on his MySpace comment. 
Things started to get a little messier around 2010, 2011. One day, Marvin gets into a car accident with his mom. His mom had some minor injuries. Alice had a great relationship with her, so she visited them. I don't know the full context, but something about the way the interaction went triggered Alice to tell Marvin that she thinks he's a psychopath. Probably the worst thing that she could have done. But alas, out of my control. He's a good looking, very fit guy and definitely had some obvious narcissist traits. But I had never really learned much about psychopaths besides watching Dexter. So when she told me and other friends about what she deduced, it was both eye-opening and a little freaky. We briefly worked together at a retail store and I saw him getting close to a younger brother of a friend of mine from school who worked with us. He was a chubby kid with low self-esteem and admired Marvin's fitness and confidence. Marvin started working out with him and the kid would always talk about how awesome Marvin is. Instead of just minding my business, I felt compelled to interject and messaged him one day, just telling him to be careful about letting Marvin get too close, as he can be manipulative. This is among the biggest regrets of my life. Of course, he tells his idol what I said, and while we remained cordial, clearly he knew what went down. He eventually leaves the job, going into hiding after a work scheme to steal big ticket items with the help of several team members, including my friend's brother. Another time, Marvin and I were smoking weed out the house of a friend of mine. My friend, let's call her Diana, very trusting person and an incredible host. I was high out of my mind and Marvin was kind of schmoozing, being highly complimentary of my friend who hosted us. Again, my stupid nosy protective instincts kick in, and I grin and comment something like, I know what you're doing. He was probably just earnestly making connections, and I assumed that he must have had manipulative intent based on what his girlfriend said. Alice told me that he's mentioned how I'm too judgmental and opinionated, specifically citing the incident at Diana's house. He also didn't like how he felt like I and our mutual friends were trying to interfere with their relationship. To be clear, I wasn't trying to hook up with this girl. I generally just didn't want to see my friend get hurt. She continued seeing him as a friend with benefits long after people told her to be wary. And at that point, I wasn't spending energy trying to nudge her. At some point though, she did break things off with him for good. The timeline is a little messy here, but in between the above incidents, I got a text from Marvin saying that he took acid and came to the realization that he's a psychopath. He then tells me some sad story about his family and says if he can't make himself become empathetic and feeling things deeply, he'll just kill himself. Being naive and not wanting anyone to die, I tell him that there's plenty of people who just want surface level connections so he doesn't need to kill himself, just needs to find other people like him. Looking back, I realized no one tells people they're a psychopath unless they're trying to scare them and he probably told me that because he knew Alice talked to me. He never thought much about her intellect and he probably figured that I was the one that told him the theory of him being a psychopath. We fall out of touch after their full breakup and him hiding after the incident with theft and I deleted his number. At some point, we connect on Facebook and he basically tells me he got addicted to coke while doing criminal business in Europe. He went to rehab and claims a psychiatrist diagnosed him as a psychopath. My stomach sank. I didn't know how to react. I asked him how it made him feel to know for sure and said it made him aware of his power. He then says he respects me and would never hurt me. I blocked him not too long after that. My last mutual contact with him was him texting me in 2012. The message was vague, I'm coming. I asked who's this and he dodges the question to coax me to admit I knew. I asked him what he wants and that I don't appreciate feeling threatened. He told me that I'm so defensive and that he just wanted to say hi. I told him I think it's uncool that he's trying to mess with me because I have a weaker ego than him. He said something strange about how I should never talk down about myself or something like that. And I block his number. This was 2012 and since then, two or three times a year, I would get an Instagram follow request from a new profile he created. 
Sometimes it's obviously him, and sometimes it will be a weird spam looking profile, but full of mutual and former friends. My heart rate goes up every time this happens. Sometimes I don't block right away because I don't want to make it obvious how much it puts me on edge. I usually keep my social medias on private, but once I opened my Twitter so I could participate in some contest. I kid you not, within three days, a faceless account only following a few accounts, my mutual friends of course, starts following me. He's made Spotify accounts to follow me, and Spotify doesn't let you block people. So instead, I just had to restrict what I share. I often thought about starting a podcast, but the whole ordeal has made me hesitant to even raise my profile to the point of being found by him. A friend of ours committed suicide a few years ago, and I'm ashamed to say that I almost didn't go to the funeral in case he would show up. I get terrified when I get calls from strange numbers. I get worried that I'll bump into him when I believe we're both in my hometown at the same time. I don't know what his goal is, and that's what bothers me the most. Is this punishment for me getting involved in his affairs over a decade ago? On the other hand, he's never made overt threats to me. He knows where I lived growing up, and I was there for many years after our last conversation. I spent many nights concerned about strange cars parked outside, but thankfully never had an issue. On the other hand, I don't know what he's capable of, and if he's connected to dangerous people. He's moved back and forth between our hometown and other places several times, and apparently changed his name along the way. My therapist suggests that perhaps he envies my large circle of deep relationships and clearly has issues with his own identity. It's disturbing for me that I'm still in his mind after a decade of not communicating. I keep praying that he finds something else to fill his boredom than making sure that I don't forget that he's out there. My friends have told me it's silly to worry about this, but it's hard when I'm having a good day and suddenly I see an Instagram notification that sucks the oxygen out of the room. I spent 10 years anxious and in fear because of his cruelty and I honestly wish he kept his word about what he would do if he couldn't find a way to be a normal human being. I believe I was in my third year of university when this happened. I was actively involved in a student organization at my university and as a result of this involvement I met a lot of new people and made a lot of new friends, equivalents of our organization, were also at the universities, and we quickly became acquainted with the other students at the other universities all through this network. At some point, I was elected the leader of the student organization and became quite popular because of it. I used to get a lot of requests on Facebook, and even though I'm generally a private person, I accepted almost any request at the time because networking was extremely important to fulfill my role as the leader of the group. We used to host big events, and what better way to promote our events than on Facebook, which was the shit at the time. Instagram and Twitter weren't big back then. We used to make posters and flyers to promote our events, and as a leader, my number was always listed on them so that I could be contacted for ticket purchases. Anyway, it's important to keep all this in mind, to fully understand some parts of the story and how I got myself into this mess. One of the friends that I had made through this organization went to a university around 3-4 to four hours away and lived about 4-5 to five hours away. We always talked on Facebook or through text and became quite close, but because of the distance between us and because we went to different unis, we rarely got to see each other unless we traveled to each other's town to attend each other's events. She didn't drive at the time, and I did not have my own car yet. So one day, when she unexpectedly told me that she was coming to my city, I got so excited. She told me that she had something urgent to do in my city, and that one of her friends had offered to drive her here. I was so excited. On the day that my friend was in my city, we arranged a time and place to meet. She told me that she couldn't stay too long because the drive back was long and she didn't want to get back too late, which I totally understood. I was just happy to see her for a few minutes. She also told me that her friend was tagging along because she would feel bad ditching him after he had driven her all the way here. I told her I didn't mind. I never met this friend of hers, but I was excited to meet yet another member 
from another organization. I've heard of her friend before, but I've never met or interacted with him. Let's call him Sam. When I first met with my friend Zoe and Sam, it was very normal. Sam seemed very quiet and shy, but quite polite and respectful. It was almost like he faded into the background. We met at a beach and he was quite literally in the background, behind us, so sometimes I forgot that he was even there. He and I exchanged some words and some laughs. I was being polite because he was my friend's friend and he was nice enough to drive her all the way here and back when she needed it, so I obviously thought he was a decent guy. When it was time for them to leave, we said bye and I thanked him again for being so nice and driving her down because we got to see each other as a result of it. He was super kind and humble about it. I really got a good first impression of him. I don't remember exactly if it was the same day or the next day, but very shortly after this day, Sam added me on Facebook. It was not strange at all to me. We had just met the other day and I could refer to him as an acquaintance now, so I was happy to accept his request. Besides, I was accepting requests from people I never met in real life, so if anything, this felt refreshing. Now this all happened a long time ago, so I don't remember all the details. But I can recall when we first became Facebook friends. He and I did exchange messages occasionally. Just friendly conversation. I think he messaged me shortly after I accepted his request to tell me that it was so nice to meet me. And we talked about Zoe for a bit. About how sweet and loving she was. It was nothing weird. If anything, it just made me feel more comfortable with him. He didn't say or do anything that would have made me feel alert or uncomfortable. After a few of these exchanges, I noticed that his messages to me became more frequent. I thought he and I would just be good acquaintances, and I didn't expect us to, or want us to, to be honest, talk more than that or get to know each other better. When he started messaging me more frequently and wanting to strike up conversations with me, I felt a little uncomfortable at first. Then I thought maybe he just had a crush on my friend Zoe, and since he seemed shy, he was trying to get close to one of her close friends so that I could put in a good word for him, or maybe even help him ask her out. I was polite and responded whenever I could, but never initiated conversation. I briefly asked Zoe about him once, and she told me that he was just a really sweet, thoughtful guy, and based on how he had driven her all the way, I could see that. I was also happy hearing it from her, assuming that he did have a crush on her. I thought, nice, she already thinks highly of him. How cute. I envisioned a cute love story for them and felt excited to potentially play a part in it. My god, was I wrong about the whole thing? During one of our conversations, Sam told me about a song or something that interests me and asked me for my number so that he could send me a few links because they were on the phone and it was just easier that way. Again, I didn't think anything of it. I don't know exactly when things shifted, but I believe it was shortly after getting my phone number that the tone of the conversation with Sam changed to being somewhat flirty and personal. At first, I thought I was just misinterpreting his kindness, but eventually it became difficult to misinterpret. He started making a lot of comments about my appearance, giving me compliments, I felt uncomfortable because, in my head, he was my friend's future boyfriend. That was a very unexpected turn of events. I started questioning his intentions, and because I didn't want anything to become ugly or escalate further, I just started responding to him less and less, and when I did respond, I'd just be polite and brief. This seemed to pique his interest more, because he began messaging me more and more. He was mostly texting me now. I am a nice person and I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt, but at the same time, I can get really annoyed with people who don't understand or respect my boundaries, and in that case, it's really difficult for me to fake anything. This happened with Sam when he kept messaging me, giving me compliments despite the fact that I pretty much stopped responding, or sometimes just responded to long paragraphs with, LOL thanks. If this was a random person, I would have told him off a long time ago, but because he was still my friend's friend, I decided to not go off on him and just hope that he takes the hint and leaves me be. 
Things kept escalating. One day, I think he messaged me 10 to 15 times in a row, talking about, I can't stop thinking about you. I really wish I was in your city so I could take you out. I want to know you better. Even though he had made some remarks and had gave me compliments, he had never been this direct so it caught me off guard, especially because he sent me so many messages. I read my messages and felt really uncomfortable. To really make you understand how I felt, I should have mentioned earlier that this organization was a cultural organization. It wasn't religious by any means, but I like that there was a certain type of respect that was expected from members towards each other so that we could all enjoy events and each other's company. As a leader of my branch, if you will, I was really big in maintaining the type of respect that was expected from members towards each other and we did not tolerate any kind of disrespect. So the fact that this man was making me uncomfortable hit me on so many different levels. I decided to give him one final chance to redeem himself by letting him sit with the fact that I read his messages and he could see that I did and I did not respond to any of them. I almost hoped that he would get mad and block me or something. He didn't. The next day, he started sending me more messages and becoming increasingly creepy by talking to me as though we had been in a relationship for years. He was saying things like, Babe, I miss your lips. Or, I miss you so much. Dude, we just met once and talked for 10 minutes total. I felt like he had officially crossed the line and I snapped. I straight up told him, Sam, I'm not sure that you realize this, but I'm not interested in you in any romantic way. And unless you can respect that, we can't be friends. You're making me very uncomfortable and I'm not sure what's going on with you, but I really hope you respect me enough to stop this nonsense talk or something like that. You know what he said? Oh, come on. Why are you going to play hard to get? He officially pushed me over the edge with that comment and I officially no longer cared about being nice or that the fact that he was my friend's friend. He was utterly disrespectful, and I didn't even think my friend should be friends with someone like that. I was definitely going to let her know. After he made that comment, I just said something like, You need help, and deleted and blocked his number and blocked his account on Facebook. I felt relieved after blocking him and was mad at myself for not doing it sooner. I thought that this would be the end of it all, but unfortunately, I was wrong. A few days later, I got a Facebook request from a profile without a picture and with a name that I did not recognize. But again, that wasn't a common, so I accepted the request. The more people I was friends with, the more exposure we'd get for our events. I thought it didn't matter to me much since I barely posted anything personal on my Facebook profile anyway being aware that there are a lot of people on my profile now that I didn't really know. The owner of this profile sent me a message within minutes of accepting them. I saw it much later that day. The message was from Sam, saying that he was sorry that he crossed the line and that he never meant to offend me. That he was really serious about me and was hoping I would give him another chance. I was so mad when I saw this because I hate when men don't understand a message that was fairly clearly articulated to them. I knew that this was just another sorry attempt on his end to reconnect with me, as if we had a fight, not realizing that there was nothing between us to begin with. I never wanted to talk to him again. I blocked his account as well without even responding to his message. Since I don't remember the details, I'll just summarize the parts I remember. Over the course of the next few weeks, Sam made multiple fake accounts and sent messages with more creepy, inappropriate comments. He also texted me from a few different numbers, always begging for my forgiveness as if I was just mad at him. He clearly did not understand the extent of my disinterest and disgust of him. What I do remember vividly and the part that freaked me out the most was the last interaction I ever had with him. On one of the days when he messaged me from my unknown number, he started the message with the usual crap about missing me and wanting to get another chance, etc. But then he sent me a screenshot of his phone homepage with a selfie of mine being his background picture. He sent it with a message that went something like, You look like a movie star and I can't stop staring at your face. 
So I had to make you my background, so I can look at you all day, and I've even showed all my friends what you look like. The fucking hell, what? This freaked me out because, one, I never posted that selfie on social media before. Two, his absolute disregard for my rejection was becoming scary, making me feel like there was some kind of delusional disconnect in his brain, which made me feel like I actually had no idea what this man was capable of. Also, even though I don't know if he was telling the truth, it really creeped me out by the idea that his friends were sitting around just looking at my picture, a picture that wasn't even meant for the public eye. It wasn't a sexual picture or anything, but a picture that I had never posted anywhere. I stared at his picture for what felt like forever, trying to think clearly and wondering what to do. I had already used words, but those didn't work on him. I decided to message him saying, Sam, you are being an absolute fucking creep. I have told you many times that I am not interested in you, and you have continued making me feel uncomfortable. I want you to delete all the pictures you have of me immediately. I know a lot of people at your university, so if you have my pictures anywhere, I will find out. And if I get another message from you again, I will be reporting you to the police for harassment. I don't ever want to hear from you again. Leave me alone. Although, saying that I would find out if he had any pictures of me was complete BS because there's no way of me actually finding out unless he flaunted them to people. The fact that I was popular and knew a lot of people made me feel comfortable in saying this because I knew that he would assume that it was true. I did not hear from Sam again after this and decided to message Zoe and finally tell her all about this. I had meant to do it sooner, but each time, I thought I would save him from embarrassment by giving him a chance to act right. At this point, I considered him creepy and unsafe and wanted to warn Zoe. I told her all about what happened and the phone screen background and everything. Zoe was absolutely appalled and apologized over and over again for introducing us and bringing him into my life. I assured her that I was not mad at her whatsoever and that it was not her fault in any way. Suddenly, she went quiet, and although we were on the phone, I almost feel that she became pale. I asked her if everything was okay, and she responded with a shaky voice telling me that there was an incident a few months ago when a girl that they knew through the organization had told her that Sam had asked her on a date in a similar persistent way. She found it charming for some reason and agreed to go on a date with him. Apparently, he had been nice the entire time until he had gotten her alone somewhere and pushed her up against the wall, trying to kiss her. When she rejected him, he became aggressive and tried forcing himself on her. The girl had said that she tried to get away, but he held her against the wall forcefully, trying to touch her in places she definitely wasn't comfortable with. Luckily, someone had walked by them at this time, forcing him to let her go, and she made a run for it. Zoe told me that this girl was someone who loved drama and was known for always exaggerating things and always being a bit of a boy who cried wolf kind of person. So no one took her too seriously when she told her story. After hearing what I said about Sam, Zoe suddenly had the realization that the girl might have been right and it hit her like a brick that Sam was really that kind of creepy, low-life person. She cut him off immediately and I think reached out to the girl, apologizing for not taking her seriously, asking her how she was doing and if she wanted to talk about it. As far as I know, she's good friends with that girl now and everyone cut Sam out of their lives and the organization. Sam, if we ever meet again, I'll give you a piece of my mind. I don't know if this belongs here, but I guess it's creepy enough to share. This probably happened to many people, but maybe we just brushed it off and didn't think nothing of it. Well, it's happened so many times, I don't think it's a coincidence anymore. I can literally have an organic thought or idea, and seconds later I see an ad for it. There was no discussion of it prior, no text messages, no notes or words logged into any of my devices. It's 100% in my mind, an internal thought, and then seconds later, scrolling through my social media page, I'll see an ad relating to it. In this instance, I was thinking about buying a new desk for my studio. 
Then an ad for a studio desk appeared. So weird. It's so damn creepy. It's like a scene out of Black Mirror. Has this ever happened to you? So this took place when I was in high school and I decided to search up my last name and then .com. I wasn't expecting for a website to pop up, but it did. The website was a page about a person with my dad's name. I thought it was a coincidence and there was a picture and it wasn't my dad. But the more I read through the page, the more real information I found out about my dad. At one point, it said a town in Europe where my dad was born and I've been to too. All the information is lining up with my dad's life, but he knows almost nothing about websites and the picture of the person is not my dad. It's really creeped me out and I don't know if someone was doing it as a joke or anything of some sorts. Back when dial up first became popular, I was 11 years old. Harry Potter had just taken the world by storm and I was hooked. I mean, seriously obsessed, late night release parties at Barnes & Noble, dressed up as a character, etc. My parents had child settings on different AOL functions. One of these were the pop of the chat rooms. I was glued to these in my free time. Now our computer was in the living room in plain view of my parents, who would randomly walk by or watch TV and grade papers a few feet away. Sometimes I would meet someone interesting in the chat rooms and we would start a private conversation on AIM, AOL Instant Messenger for you young folk. Usually it started with ASL, age, sex, location. The first two, age and sex, I would be honest, but the last, I would always lie and pick a state I found interesting at the time. Once I was messaged by someone from a Harry Potter chat room. Before even asking any Harry Potter related questions and trading info, he asked, Are you single? I said yes. I wasn't really allowed to date yet. Keep in mind, he knew I was 11. He asked if I'd be interested in an older boyfriend. I said maybe, but it depended. He asked if 32 was okay. I stared at the screen in horror. I felt sick to my stomach and yelled for my mom. She came over and gasped and told me to block him. We reported him to the chat admin. I wasn't allowed in the chats anymore at that time, but I didn't want to go near them anyway. My mom contacted AOL customer service and explained, nicely to put it, how their child controls were crap and like live bait to pervs. Before Facebook Marketplace became an easy way to buy and sell things, I would always look for deals on Craigslist. I had bought several things without any problems until one day I had a creepy experience. Being in my early 20s and still living with my parents, I had a part-time job and bought things I wanted on Craigslist since I never really cared about buying brand new things and definitely did not want to pay full price, especially if I could find a good deal on fairly new things. I was planning a girl's trip with my friends and wanted a good camera to take so I could capture beautiful pictures. So I started my search on Craigslist for a used but good quality camera. I asked about several different ones, but they were either out of my price range or already sold. I came across this one that said $300 or buyer's best offer. It was an older digital Canon model and appears to be in great shape from the photos. My parents owned a non-digital one that I could use and still take pictures with, but this one was obviously better. After emailing back and forth, he was willing to go down to $150. He asked me for all my information like name, address, email, bank information for wire transfer. That should have been my first red flag. I responded that I don't give out my personal information, but since this area is local and is not too far from me, I'd be willing to meet him and pay in cash. After he didn't respond for several days, I thought to myself, this was probably fraud. So I decided to continue my search as I was determined to find a camera. Still having no luck, I suddenly received an email back from the guy stating that he was willing to meet up and exchange the money for the camera. 
This wasn't my first rodeo, and I knew to meet up in the daytime in a public parking lot. I was stoked and asked for his availability. We decided to meet up on a Sunday at 4 p.m. in the parking lot of a shopping center. That Sunday came and I was so excited and could not wait to have that new used camera to play with. It was a gloomy cold day. It looked like it was going to rain. I remember wearing blue jeans and a long sweater. I went to the bank and pulled out $160 and then drove to the parking lot of our destination. I arrived 15 minutes early as I didn't want him waiting on me. I sat in my car with a heater on, listening to music. I waited in the parking lot for about 45 minutes for him to show, but nothing. I sent him a message asking if he was on his way. No reply. I came to realize that I was being played and he wasn't going to show. It was starting to get late and with it being already ugly outside, I didn't feel comfortable being alone meeting in the dark. As I'm about to back up, what looks to be a dark green van pulled up in front of me. The van was so old looking and the paint was chipping off. I sat there for a minute thinking that it could be the guy, but he just stayed in his van looking at me and not getting out of his car. By this time, all these questions started going through my head. Was it him? Should I get out of the car? I said to myself, yeah right, you're crazy. What if he grabbed you and threw you in the van? Admittedly, I have watched way too many Lifetime movies, and being only 100 pounds, there's no way I'm getting out of my car. I continued to put my car in reverse and drove off. As I got on the freeway, I noticed a vehicle close behind me. At first, I didn't think much of it other than why would you drive so close to someone in such bad weather? But as I exited the freeway, so did the vehicle. This could be a coincidence and maybe I'm just paranoid. I couldn't really tell what kind of car it was since it was dark and all I could see was the bright headlights. I did however notice that it didn't have a front license plate. Was this the same van in the parking lot? I kept looking back in my rearview mirror as I passed through the green lights, hoping that the car would turn, but it was still behind me. I turned my right turn signal on to switch lanes, and so did the car. In a panic, I knew I had to keep driving and not go straight to my house. I didn't want them to know where I live if they were really following me. I tried to speed up to get through the yellow light in hopes that they would get stuck at a red, but as I ran the red light, I just knew that they were following me and I really suspected that it was the van from the shopping center. I had to lose them. Luckily, my parents live in a community where there's a lot of turns different ways that will eventually lead me back to my house. I passed the turn to my street and kept going straight, planning to turn left ahead. I quickly turned, and so did they. I know it was a residential area, and I should have been driving slow, but I sped up to try to lose them. Took so many different turns, left, right, straight, I eventually lost sight of them. About a few minutes later, as I was speeding up the hill, the van was heading down the hill. The man stared straight into my eyes as we passed each other. It looked like he had a grin on his face. At that moment, I knew it was the man from the parking lot. My hands were shaking on the steering wheel, and I had the thought that I needed to lose him before he turns around. I sped up the hill and made a sharp left turn then on another left, driving all the way down another hill. I kept staring in my mirrors to make sure you didn't catch up to me. Then I made a right turn, getting closer to my house. I could feel my heart beating faster. Pulling up to my house, I kept hitting the clicker to my garage door so it would open. As it was almost open, I drove up my driveway so quickly into my garage, closing it so fast behind me. I turned off my car waiting there for a few minutes, trying to catch my breath. I got out of my car shaking like crazy and stand there still trying to see if I can hear the van coming up my street. Nothing. All I heard was crickets. I walked inside and sat down on my couch. Since that day, I have never used Craigslist again. So this happened a little over three years ago and my life has been in shambles ever since. For context, I'm a 23 year old female and I had just turned 21 when this happened. I had recently gotten out of a 2 year relationship. By just, I mean I had been 100% single for about 9 months. Not even a single date in that entire time. Back then, my friends were kind of teasing me to get back in the dating scene 
and after a few weeks of that, I thought, why not? Now, I wasn't looking for anything serious, as I was busy with school and work, but didn't mind having a little fun and going out on a few dates here and there. My friend suggested I sign up for Tinder, so I got my profile set up, added my corny little hobbies and a picture of me, which looked nice, but not something that I would think would attract creeps. So a few days go by, I swiped, got matches, casually chatted with a few guys. It was fun and seemed to be going pretty well. That was until I met Sean. Sean seemed to be the perfect dude. He had a good job, owned his own condo, and was also pretty good looking. I quickly took an interest in him and he took an interest in me. Honestly, I never thought I would like someone that I never met in person, but I was starting to. So we continued to message or talk every day. By then, I had given him my phone number. He had also asked me out for a drink three or four times, but I was worried, nervous, and hadn't been on a first date in years. So I kept blowing him off with excuse after excuse. He seemed patient with me, which made me feel like it was safe, as well as a good idea to get to know him on a different level. I finally broke out of my shell, and we agreed to meet up at a small local pub a few blocks away from my apartment. Although I was out of my shell, I didn't want him to pick me up, so I said I would meet him over there. It was only about a 7-10 to 10 minute walk, so I decided that would be my best option. The night came. I was nervous, to the point that I was thinking about canceling it altogether and hiding under a rock. I wish I would have. Anyways, I get to the pub about 10 minutes before we agreed to meet. As I'm sitting there, I noticed two kind of dirty looking dudes in their 20s staring at me. I kind of brush it off as we are in a bar. I wait there for 20 minutes and he hasn't showed up at this time and I get a little annoyed about him being late and those two guys. I message him asking if he was almost there and I kid you not, one of the dirty dudes phone buzzes in that exact moment. I'm paranoid at this point but I'm telling myself that it's just a coincidence. But then I see that the message is read and he's typing a response, all while the dude is also typing. I'm still thinking it's a coincidence, but I definitely have my guard up. He messaged me telling me that he's a little late and he'll be there soon. Same thing happens when I reply. Dude's phone buzzes and he reads the message. At that point, I know I'm not being paranoid. I'm being catfished and by two creeps. I text him saying that I'm going to get something out of my car. He didn't know I walked there. I walk out the door, trying to act casual, as if I was really going to my car to get something. But I don't think they bought it. As I'm about 300 feet away from the bar, I turn around and I see them both exiting, walking in my direction. This is when I know that they're definitely after me and that I better make it to my house before they get me. So I take a shortcut through an alley. I know. Going through an alley while someone's following you is not a good idea, but there's a lot of cars in there and other small alleys for me to duck into if I see them running towards me. So I'm halfway home and I'm walking pretty fast and then I see them emerge in the alley. They must have been in the alley for a while, but I hadn't seen them yet. Anyways, I'm able to make it home safe. I lock my doors, I go up into my room and look out the window and I see them walking by but not looking at my house or anything. So I'm glad I lost them. Anyways, I don't know what these guys wanted, but this scared the shit out of me and I haven't been on a dating app ever since. I'm telling my story mainly to warn people, be careful on dating apps, you never know who you're talking to, and always trust your gut. If I hadn't been observant and trusted my gut, I might have had a few more beers and at that point, anything could have happened. After taking several months for myself, coming out of a six year relationship who I had been with throughout my high school years, I decided it was time to put myself out there and start casually dating. I was really unsure how to meet people and decided to create a profile on a free dating site. I created a profile, uploaded my personal interest and my photo. For a few weeks I had no luck until I got a message. Hello gorgeous, how are you doing today? I see that we have a lot in common and would love to get to know you. After reading his message, I checked his profile 
and realized we did have a lot in common. At first, we started messaging back and forth for several days. We had so much in common and so much to learn about each other. We decided to exchange numbers and we text constantly throughout the day. I would get butterflies reading his messages as he was so smooth and had his way with his words. I thought to myself, this is too good to be true. Am I being catfished? Is he really who he says he is? Is he married? After a while, he would talk to me on the phone and we would even video chat so I at least knew the picture was him. He wanted to meet face to face, but even though we had some amazing conversations, I really wasn't ready to meet him in person yet. He kept bringing it up and pressuring me to meet up. Finally, I said, okay, let's meet in the park. I figured since it was a crowded public place, what could go wrong? I remember the day like it was yesterday. The sky was clear and the sun was out. It was a beautiful day outside. I wore a romper with these sunflowers. I was sitting on the bench waiting for him to arrive. As I look up from my phone, I see him walking across the parking lot. He was gorgeous. He had beautiful dark brown slick back hair and bright blue eyes. After an awkward side hug, we sat down and talked. He sure knew how to make a girl feel special. It was a perfect day. We spent hours at the park hanging out and talking. It was starting to get late and chilly outside, and I said I would have to leave because I was getting cold and hungry. He quickly shouted, no. I was stunned at first, but didn't think too much of it. I said I was hungry and ready to go. He said, let's get something to eat then. I thought, um, sure, okay, why not? Let's drive separate since we have our own cars. I told him to follow me and that I'll take him to the best taco shop around. Pulling up to the taco shop, we decided to order our food and then go sit outside as it had a little fire pit and other heaters. As we were eating outside, it became very windy. We grabbed our food and sat in my car. I was eating a burrito and dropped some sauce on my shirt. I reached in the bag to grab a napkin only to realize that they didn't give us any. I told them that I would be right back and that I was going to get us napkins. As I was walking back to my car, I noticed he had his phone in his hand and was looking through my glove compartment. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, looking for a napkin. Not thinking anything suspicious, I said. Here, I told you I went to go get some. It was getting late and I had to work in the morning. We said our goodbyes and drove off. Pulling up to my house, I got a text from him saying, I had a good time tonight. I replied, me too. Good night. The next morning, I wake up to several texts on my phone. Do you want to hang out again? What are you wearing? Can I come and lay with you? Hello? Hello, are you there? Why are you not texting me back? I found this very strange and replied, Sorry, I passed out and my phone was on silent. I get up and start getting ready and I hear my phone going off. I look at it. Hello, beautiful. I was running late, so I put my phone down and finished getting ready so I can leave for work. I got another message saying, Hope you're having a good day. I replied, Thanks, you too. It was a busy work day with meetings and projects, and I had left my phone at my desk. Finally getting a break, I went to my desk and sat down. I got my phone out, and I kid you not, there are 30 messages. What are you doing? How's work going? Do you want to hang out after? I guess after getting no replies to his messages, he aggressively said, Hello? Why are you not texting me back? At this point, I knew something was off. I ignored him and continued working. It was a long day and getting late, with the text messages keep coming in. I replied, Sorry, busy work day. I had no free time. What's up with all these crazy text messages? Oh, I was just worried because you didn't answer. I told him that I was exhausted and going home, and was going straight to sleep, and that I would talk to him tomorrow and to have a good night. Laying in bed that night, I was thinking to myself, why was he starting to be so possessive? Yeah, we talked a lot, but it's been one date. That's not what I want for myself, nor did I need the drama. I had just started being myself again, and I was not going to let some crazy guy hold me down. So I decided I was going to break it off with him the next morning. Little did I know what was coming my way. I woke up the next morning only to find my phone having a gazillion missed calls, voicemails, and text messages. At this point, I was furious. I sent him a text saying that it's not going to work out. 
I'm sorry, but I can't be with someone who blows up my phone just because I didn't come to my phone at every given moment. Well, that was a mistake. The thing just got a whole lot worse for me. He called me immediately, but I ignored it. Calling back over and over again, I decided to turn my phone off so I could focus on my job. After several hours of my phone being off, I turned it back on, only to receive more messages. Why aren't you picking up? You can't run from me. I demand you speak to me. Talk to me. I am sorry. If you don't talk to me, I will go to your job. At this point, I started freaking out. I called my best friend, and she could hear it in my voice that something was wrong. Does he know where you work? No, I never told him where I worked. He just knows what I do for work. Does he know where you live? No, we met up in a park. She insisted I block his number, so I did just that. A few days go by and nothing. I finally start to relax and put it all behind me until one day after work. It was getting dark, but it still had enough light outside to see. I walk up to my car to get in, only to find a note attached to my windshield. I looked around, got in my car, and opened the note. It said, You can't ignore me forever. I quickly locked my doors and drove off. I didn't see anyone in plain sight. I thought to myself, Was someone messing with me? As I drove home, frightened, I kept looking in my rearview mirrors to see if someone was following me. As I got to my apartment, I parked under my carport, which was wide open. I grabbed my purse and darted inside, locked the doors behind me, and closed the blinds. I was sitting in the dark, waiting to see if I hear anything. What am I doing? Am I freaking myself out? I turned on the TV, trying to relax, and ended up falling asleep on my couch. I woke up to the sound of the doorknob jiggling at 2am. I sat up on my couch, thinking it was a dream. Then I hear three loud bangs. I jumped up terrified. Sitting there paralyzed, I couldn't move as I was in shock. After sitting there for what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes, I got off the couch and looked through the peephole, but there was no one there. Scared out of my wits, I went back to my couch, kept the TV and lights on. The next morning, as I walked out of my door to leave for work, I noticed my door was unlocked. I stood in my doorway for minutes, thinking how did my door get unlocked? Did I forget to lock it? Did someone get in last night? Confused, I took my keys out and locked my door. As I drove off to work, I couldn't stop thinking about the door. As I arrived to work, I walked into my office and my phone was starting to go off with text messages from my unknown number. I missed you. It was so good to see you last night. I told you we would see each other again. Messages were still coming in, but this time, he sent photos. Photos of me sleeping on my couch. I literally let out a scream and dropped my phone. Shaking, and with the help of my coworker, I dialed 911. As I waited for the police to arrive, I sat there horrified, wondering how he got in. How did I not hear the door open? Was I dead asleep? Was it because I left the TV on? Was he just that good at sneaking into homes? Why do I not have a dog? All these thoughts going through my head. Once they arrived, they took my statement, me giving them a detailed description of the guy. They asked if I had somewhere to stay that night. I said yes, I could stay at my friend's. They escorted me to my house so I could pick up a few things, then to my friend's house. I thanked the officers and walked inside. Sitting on my friend's couch, my friend and I discussed the scary situation and I decided to take myself out of the situation. I changed my number, email, deleted the dating app, even broke my lease on the apartment. I decided to move into my parents' house until things calmed down. I never heard from the guy again. Oh, and that's the last time I ever tried online dating. Trigger warning before this story for brief sexual assault. I'm a 29-year-old non-binary person. I'm an autistic, introvert, and hate being touched. When this happened, I was 20. I grew up in a small town in southwest Ohio. I had just gotten back from my uncle's house in Oklahoma. I have horror stories about him too, but anyways. I was on meetme.com before it was myyearbook.com, and that was before Facebook but after MySpace. While I was lonely, 
and just started surfing to see who caught my eye. I got a message from a dude on the meetup app. We hit it off online. It took me about a month before I actually decided to meet him. He messaged me one day and asked if we could meet. After I gave it a bit of thought, I agreed. My problem is that I didn't have a license or a car. So my only other option besides walking was taking my brother's bike. I went through my contacts and even asked my dad. All attempts were met with a no, even though I had $10 on me for gas. So, as I was on my way to his house, stupid I know, I was about halfway there when I got the shock of my life. I was riding on one side of the main road going through town. I hit a sewer drain and somehow my front tire got lodged in the sewer grates and sent me flying over the handlebars. Luckily, there weren't any oncoming cars coming at the time, but the folks across the street and the passing drivers had a good laugh. I, however, did not. Well, he turned out to be a jerk because he had a car, but refused to drive me home. When I offered gas money, suddenly his car had all these problems. Before I had left, I asked my friend to pick me up from his house when I called from his Wi-Fi. I was broke and I couldn't pay for phone service. Keep that in mind. It was time to call my friend. I called once, no answer. Called again, no answer. I called a third time and she finally answered, only to tell me that she was busy and I had to wait an hour before she could get me. I waited the entire hour, uncomfortable because of his behavior towards me and was trying to go somewhere I didn't want it to go. His behavior started getting more erratic and threatening. I said that, it's about time I head out soon, cause it's gonna get dark. He begged me to stay. I called the friend again, hoping that she would say that she's on her way, or that I'll be here soon, but no answer, so I just decided to start walking. I was devastated. I knew the walk was gonna be long and difficult, and I couldn't ride the bike. I decided that I would have to leave my brother's bike behind. Well, about 13 miles into my walk home, I checked my phone to see what time it was. It was 7.30. It was about to get dark. This black F-150 stops and asks me if I need a ride. He seemed nice, but I'm naive at times and miss red flags, even though they're smacking me right in the face. There were no other vehicles on the road at the time, so we sat there for a few minutes while I decided... When I finally agreed to get into his truck, I noticed a tire iron on the floorboard. This is important to the story. He was heavy set with short black hair, thin framed glasses, and a mustache. He wore a gray shirt with blue jeans and brown boots. He started with the typical questions like, What's your name? How old are you? Then he asked if I was single. I replied matter-of-factly that I was walking home from my then boyfriend's house. We got about 4.5 miles from the place where my family lived when he went on a rant on how women nowadays are too easy and will just fuck anybody with a dick. He reached over into my spaghetti strap shirt under my bra, grabbed my breast and started rubbing it. I froze. He stopped and went into my sweatpants. At this point, I'm trying to come up with a way to get away from this man and then remember the tire iron that was by my feet. I asked if I could please have a cigarette. He said yes, so I set my backpack down between my legs on the floorboards to make it look like I was going to look for a cigarette. The backpack was slightly on top of the tire iron. I grabbed it and said, if you don't stop this truck, I'll make us wreck. He still didn't stop driving. I was thoroughly pooping myself at this point. I swung my arm backwards and busted his back window out and screamed at him to stop the truck. He was screaming at me and cussing me out, calling me all sorts of colorful terms. He slammed on the brakes and I hopped out of the truck and ran behind the truck to the left side of the road. Again, more stupidity. Where we stopped was a part of a national reserve that I happened to know quite well. You may be asking yourself, why didn't I run the other way? Well, on that side of the road was a bit of a fence and land and had a gate that was always locked. Anyways... I ran towards the woods that headed towards my family's house. I knew that if I didn't get home soon, that I was going to get lost in the dark woods. I was much bigger than I am now, and I was sweating heavily, so I needed a few breaks. 
My heart was pounding so hard, and it was hard for me to catch my breath. I swore that every little noise was him about to grab me. I made it home after an hour of trekking through the woods. I told my family what happened, and they shrugged it off like normal. It made me feel very invalidated. My family has never been a source of comfort or safety. Just another reason why I don't trust anyone anymore. When I calmed down and cooled off, I decided to confront my so-called friend. I was looking in the parking lot for her van. She was home. I knocked on her door and confronted her, and she finally came clean. She said that she was home the whole time. I told her what happened, and she didn't care at all. I was really hurt and furious with everyone in my life at that point. I haven't talked to her since. To my so-called friend and the dirty old man, thank the gods, I'll never meet either of you ever again. I'm a 22-year-old female for context. While I was living at uni by myself, I messaged a man who had a PS2 for sale on Facebook. It was a really good price and looked to be in really good condition. I really should have known that it was too good to be true. Anyway, I messaged him about it and he says he would drop it off straight after work and says that he's working in a building site near where I live. All good, right? Except he keeps on saying he'll do me a solid and drop it right to my door, even though I repeatedly said I would meet him at a nearby park. He said, okay, fine. He wasn't happy about it, but whatever. I was getting a PS2 and buzzing about it. So a few hours go by and I walk up the hill to chill with my friend Adam, who's a bloke and the same age as me. I mention that I'm meeting a man for a PS2 and Adam's like, you can't just meet a random dude at a car park. I'm also very petite. I guess if someone wanted to grab me, they could, which was Adam's thinking. I agreed to let Adam come with me, and actually it was a good idea. The man texted me again asking if it was still good to meet up and what I was wearing. I thought to recognize me, so I told him what I'm wearing and what I look like, and then I mentioned that I would be with a stocky, dark haired man with a beard. He stops replying and deletes his Facebook account. I never hear from him again. I can't help but to think that something dodgy was going to happen and my friend making me tell the guy I wouldn't be alone prevented it from happening. This happened a few years ago. I was traveling with my ex-boyfriend. We were in Nebraska, which as most of us know is all cornfields. For some reason, OnStar took us off the interstate, so we were on a back highway and came up to a four-way stop. We see a car that's seemingly broken down in the middle of it, which I found odd. So I said, don't stop, and he said, okay, but then stopped at the stop sign anyway. As soon as he stopped, three guys got out of the car. I told my ex, get the hell out of here. He quickly turned to start off speeding. As I looked in the mirror, I could see one of them holding out something at us. I'm unsure if it was a machete or a gun. More people started coming out of the corn near the car as well. Certainly, they were planning on tricking, ambushing, and killing someone. First time poster here. I've been spam reading stories on here for weeks now, and I'm obsessed with the subreddit. A post I read recently reminded me of something that happened to me and my buddy a while back. It's not as insane as some of the posts here, but it's definitely creepy as hell. So it starts when one of our friends gets a message from a match on Tinder. But instead of being interested in him, she tells him that she finds the other guy in a profile picture hot. My roommate at the time. We'll call him Dave. So he reaches out to Dave, cause why not? Happy to hook a buddy up. We all thought this was a hilarious way to meet someone. So it all plays out as some Tinder dates are expected. They meet up, go for a drink, end up back at his place. I remember him telling me that she was a little weird, but nothing too ridiculous not to hook up with. So they start making out, and then things got weird. She started getting aggressive and demanded that he aggressively squeeze her breasts as hard as he can. 
He was weirded out by this, but went for it anyways. But it was never enough for her. She wanted him to squeeze it so hard that it would hurt her, and she started getting mad at him for not doing it hard enough. Anyways, he tried even though it was super uncomfortable, and eventually called it off, and the hookup just ended there. She wasn't happy about it, but she didn't do anything too crazy after that. So that was supposed to be that. He told her that he wasn't interested in seeing her again. She didn't get super stalkery, but she did send him a bunch of messages after that, pretty much indicating that she's not getting the picture. So he blocked her, and we didn't hear from her for weeks. We looked at this as just a weird hookup story, and that was that. Except the weirdest and creepiest part came from there, and somehow it ended up involving me. I'm in my room and matched with a girl on Tinder. When I first matched with her, something felt weird. It just felt like I recognized her. No, at this point I only saw a few pictures of her when Dave met her the first time. So immediately, her messages were very sexually aggressive, and because of this, my warning bells are going off, and I'm not really biting. Like she went straight into saying that she wanted to meet and bone instead of a date. And then she messaged me asking if my address was, and it was my address. So I'm fucking tripping out. I have no idea how to respond and am completely creeped out that this woman knows where I live. But then I kind of realize who she is and send a few screenshots to Dave. He confirms it's her and we have a what the fuck moment before I block her and don't even respond. A bit anticlimactic, but it ended there. Didn't blow up to a full on stalker or murderer or anything. I'm not sure if she was trying to get to me or if she was trying to get to him through another one of his friends, but it was one of the creepier encounters I've had. Reading these stories makes me look back on that one with a different perspective instead of just a funny story. Like she had the making of a full stalker material, or was she dangerous? Glad we didn't find out. Tonight, while eating at a 24 hour IHOP late at night, 1am, I was seated with my dad beside a big window. Out of the corner of my eye I see a kid, about high school aged, or maybe college like me, at the oldest. He was making a super creepy face. It was a split second glance, but I think he had his eyes rolled back or something to scare me. Then as soon as I looked over and did a double take, because of the creepy face he made, he holds up his phone with the screen facing me and does a weird shuffling quickly up to the window as if trying to show me something on his phone. I realize as he gets close that the screen shows Snapchat with the front camera on. So since the screen was facing me, I saw myself on the phone screen and he snaps a picture of me which I could see as the front of the screen was facing me. And then he runs in a weird shuffling run. I know it's just some silly teenager crap, but it's mildly unsettling and I felt creeped out for the rest of my meal. I even debated on running outside to find him and splash him with a water bottle on his face or something, just for being such a creep. But obviously that would be overkill and he seemed to disappear anyways. Is this some sort of TikTok challenge or something that I don't know about? Is making creepy faces at someone and then taking a weird front face picture of them a thing? I know it's harmless, but it sure was disturbing in the moment. So this happened like a decade ago. I can't remember her name or how we met. My first memory is sitting with her late at night in a noisy pub on a first date. The waitress had taken our drink order, so we were talking about this and that, and the conversation happens to be on funny video clips. So I show her a funny clip on my phone, she giggles, and then proceeds to show me one. So I take her phone, and it's a clip of a man getting his head chopped off by religious extremists. This feeling of horror, sorrow, and total emptiness comes over me, like a void, like a vast body of dark waters. There's nothing to say, nothing to do. Nobody come back, nowhere to go from here, because it's seen and can never be unseen, and I wasn't given a choice in the matter. I just stare at her phone until it locks and the light goes off. I look up at her, and she's just sitting there, taking in my reaction, smiling. 
There was no second date. I just need to type the story out because it is still so unbelievably so real to me that I can't even believe it's real. Not sure if this is the right sub to be posting this, but hopefully it applies. So last fall, I started using dating apps seriously because I really wanted to branch out and meet new guys. I moved home after I graduated in May, which was still in the pretty early stages of COVID, so I was lonely. I had only ever used Tinder, so my friend told me that I should try Bumble, and at first, it was fun. I matched with a few guys, and they were nice, but the convos kind of died off after a while. I didn't really form a real connection with anyone on there. One of the guys I matched with asked for my Snapchat, which I gave him so we could talk on there, and we followed each other on Instagram. That kind of stuff is harmless to me, and I didn't really think much of it. Our convos didn't last long, and we stopped talking after just a few days. He was a little strange, and I was turned off by it. Fast forward a couple months, and I get a message from him on Instagram. He told me that he unfollowed me because of my support for Joe Biden during the election, and then proceeded to spam me with over 40 messages trying to convince me to change my views and vote for Trump. I'm a very liberal person, and if I would have known he was like this, I would have never spoken to him. He kept telling me how people have blocked him before for doing this and to please understand where he's coming from. His last few messages were memes to ease the tension on the one-sided convo. He and I never talked long enough for him to feel comfortable messaging me like that. I didn't respond, I didn't even block him. I opened the messages so he could see that I saw them and then unfollowed him. The next morning I got a notification telling me this message has been unsent by the sender for every single message. Of course, I screen recorded it and sent it to my friend to tell her what happened because it was creepy and bizarre. It was over after that though, and the topic of this guy didn't come up again, so I moved on. A few weeks ago, I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw a post by a local news station that was shared from the town that this guy was from in my state that's about an hour away from me. It was a news article about a guy who shot and killed an 87-year-old woman who lived in his apartment complex with a semi-automatic rifle. He was trying to get other residents out of their apartment until he was shot and killed as well by a resident in order to protect the others who lived there. As I was reading about this guy, the guy's name and face seemed so familiar, and then it clicked. It was the same guy. I went back to the screen recording of the messages I took a few months ago and they confirmed it was him. I'm not sure how to describe what my response was, but I got really sweaty and my heart was racing when I made the realization. It's extremely disturbing to know that I spoke to this man and even had a weird experience with him. It's been a few weeks since I found out and I still feel weird about it. I was just reading about it today since more details have been reported since the initial shooting. Sometimes I think about the what ifs, like, what if I responded to the messages the way I wanted to and called him a creep and a weirdo and pissed him off to the point of violence and he tried to harm me? God, I hope the woman he unfairly murdered is resting in eternal peace. Thank you for reading. If you made it this far, be wary of people on dating apps. So, I'm 23 and live in California. Last year I decided to use Tinder for the first time. I had previously used Hot or Not and Plenty of Fish, but mostly just got bots and scammers, so I already wasn't very big on online dating. However, I was feeling bored on a Friday afternoon, so I decided to install Tinder and just see what happened. After creating an account, I began swiping people, and it wasn't more than a half hour later after I got off the app that I was matched with someone. For a little context, I'm what you call bisexual, and I matched with a 25-year-old dude named Aiden. Aiden was what I would call attractive, and he had similar interests in gaming and coding. I decided to go ahead and send him a message, but before I could even send one, he sent me a message. The message read, Hey, saw you new on Tinder, and thought I'd reach out to say hi. 
I said hi back, and the two of us began talking about our love of video games, movies, and coding. He told me that he was a full-time coder and makes a salary only working four hours a day. He asked me if I would be down to chill with him sometime. I then offered to have him over at my house because I was alone and he lived with his parents. He seemed very excited all of a sudden and said that he would love to come over. We agreed on him coming over in an hour so that I could tidy up my room and get my PC ready for gaming. After about an hour or so, I sent him my address, and he said that he was on his way. Now normally, I wouldn't have invited someone to my house that I'd never met before, but this guy seemed harmless, and he was attractive, so I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. I heard a knock on my front door, and looked out the peephole, and saw it was Aiden. He had a little bottle of red wine in his hand, and a smile across his face. We hadn't discussed drinking wine together, but I did in fact like red wine, and the brand that he had with him happened to be my favorite brand. I opened the door and greeted him. I told him that that wine was my favorite, and asked him if he was a mind reader. He laughed it off and said I'd just strike him as a red wine guy. I asked him how he planned on getting home if he ended up drinking too much, and he said that he Ubered to my house. We ended up having a couple glasses of wine on my back patio and just talked about life, work, and shared our coming out stories. After the wine, we went inside to play on the PC and had a blast. After the gaming, he showed me his laptop, which he had brought with him to show me his work. Eventually, I had to use the restroom, so I excused myself to pee. I then heard him approach the bathroom door, turn the knob. Because I didn't lock the door behind me, he just came right in completely unannounced and without warning, and just started grinding me from behind while forcefully grasping my shoulders. I shoved him off of me and just kind of jokingly said, that's a bit intrusive. And he just smiled at me and said, I just wanted to see how you would react. I left the bathroom and walked into the kitchen with him walking right behind me. I asked him if he wanted more wine or maybe some water. But before I could grab the water bottles from the fridge, this dude pushed himself against me and groped my private parts while smiling at me super creepily. This time, I was completely taken aback. I shoved him off of me forcefully and yelled at him. I told him that we just met and I didn't think it was right time to just jump into something sexual. He said that I was just a waste of time and that I had no idea what I was doing and I gave gays a bad name, then said I was being homophobic I told him that if I was homophobic that I would not be hanging out with him and talking the way we were and that I found him attractive but he was crossing major boundaries. He just laughed and said, in the gay community there are no boundaries. And then just like that he said he had to go. Thank God, I thought to myself. I walked him to the front door and he walked out without saying goodbye or anything. I didn't think anything else of it and decided I needed to take a shower. I got into the shower, and after about 15 minutes into the shower, I kept hearing a tink, tink sound coming from the other end of the door. I peek out through the sliding glass door of the shower and look down towards the bottom of the door. To my shock, I see Aiden holding a freaking spoon to the bottom of the door, looking in at me while I was showering. I can only see this because of how high off the floor the door sat. Not knowing what to do, I just pretended I didn't notice and slowly turned the shower off. I got out, wrapped a towel around my waist, and prepared to confront him by yanking the door open. Before I could do that, I heard him snap a picture on his phone. I flung the bathroom door open, and he flew down the hall, out my front door. I saw him getting into a white Honda Civic and drive away. He had lied to me about taking an Uber for some reason. I have no idea what the hell he took a picture of, or why he took it in the first place, but I can imagine it wasn't for anything good. I immediately blocked him on Tinder and was paranoid that he would return. So that's my story of a Tinder creep who groped me in my own house. Edit. I did lock the door after the first time. I think he got through my back sliding glass door. I met two girls from Tinder that I have no intention of ever seeing again. This takes place around the same time Tinder came out as an Android app and I was kind of excited to give it a try. Those were the better days though. 
When I met this girl named Kaylee on the app, she was very quirky and outspoken. I liked that about her. But she had something about her. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I was always on the app talking to her. I would shut myself up in the room and just talk to her for hours. When Kaylee decided she wanted to meet up, I was excited and told her I loved to. I met her in the park in the middle of downtown and we hung out and walked around the area just talking and bullshitting. We became friends and soon after were dating. It took a few weeks to feel each other out and get the relationship going, but shortly after that she had to move a little ways away. I told her I would come see her all the time and she told me that she'll hold me to it. I never thought she could have done what she did to me, but this is how things had to be I guess. When she got settled in, I came over and we spent the night together. I did this for a little while here and there and we were even talking about later moving in to some place together. I liked her idea to do so. It was such a great feeling that wouldn't ultimately last for too long. Kaylee started getting distant from me a bit after that. She would decline for me to come over on days that we had planned to and said she had got herself a job somewhere. I'd been to the place she said she worked and I knew she was lying. I wasn't trying to catch her in a lie. I just ate there sometimes and have so before we even met. I called her one night when I got off of work to tell her I had got her something and heard her phone pick up and hang up. I figured it was a glitch of some sort and called again. A guy with a rough voice answered the phone and told me to stop calling. I got on the Tinder app to message her to see if her number had been shut off but she never answered. Confused, I went over to her house to see what was going on and she answered telling me to go home and that we would see each other later. She told me that I had called the wrong number, though I knew it was a lie. Come to find out, the guy that answered the phone was someone she was cheating on me with and she never told me that she wanted to end the relationship. I sent her one last text that I was officially ending our relationship and deleting her number. She replied with so many messages begging me not to, which I ignored. She cheated on me and lied about it. I wasn't going to stick around with someone that was going to do that to me. So later I got back on Tinder to find someone else after I finally had gotten over her and the hurt. I found a girl named Sam who was kind of on the quiet side, but she was nice. Long story short, we talked, met, and ended up together. Weeks and weeks went by and I noticed all she wanted to do was go to the bar. Every night to her was ladies night and I would just be the third wheel. If I spoke up about wanting to do anything else, she hit me and belittled me. Sam might have been on the quiet side but when she had a few drinks in her, she would turn into a loud and obnoxious person and didn't even consider my feelings or anything I wanted to do. I was in a relationship with her, yes. And I did love her, but she had a problem. She would always tell me to be a man when I tried to talk to her about anything. And I finally figured out what her issue was after she backed me into the corner one night. She was a major alcoholic and had no self-control when she would drink. I'd drink with her and all that, so at least she couldn't get me on that. But the abuse was too much to handle. The last straw that broke wasn't with the alcohol problem, but with a drug problem she started. She liked to take pills. The cops knocked on my door one day asking if she lived at my house. She had told the police that she lived there and they wanted to search my house for drugs. I had to keep telling them that she didn't live at my house and gave them her address because I was done with her at that point. I had been lied to before and that hurt bad enough but to lie to the police and try to get me involved in her drug adventures I was not going to take so I broke up with her and felt like a weight had been lifted off of me. I've since found someone on Tinder that isn't crazy and isn't a cheater. She's been my girlfriend for a long time now and I don't see an end in sight since we work well with each other. Kaylee ended up getting pregnant with a guy she cheated on me with and he left her for someone without kids. Sam is a pill head now and she's gotten into the jail loop. I'm glad I didn't stick around with those girls and watch them ruin their lives. I just got told on Facebook about it. Everyone knows each other. Smaller towns are like that.
So my fiance and I have been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three-year-old kitten we have already. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, let's look on Craigslist. So I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was two and a half hours away from my home. I inquired about it around 10.30 p.m. I know it was late, but almost immediately I got a response. She sounded very nice over text and asked to see where I lived so she would feel more settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house. I know, I should have dropped it. At the time, I thought nothing of it, so I sent them a video. We set up time the next day to meet. Next day came. I wasn't going to take my fiance, but he insisted on coming with me because he wanted to protect me just in case, since Craigslist is sketchy. So we drove 2 hours and 30 minutes on our way there. As we were on our way, I was texting the girl, telling her that we would get there on time, and she responded with, Great, see you then. We arrived to the home, me in the driver's seat and my fiance in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl and I got no response. I called, no response. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour and no response. I went up to the house and was knocking on the door, nothing. There was a car in the driveway but no response from the number or at the door. We got there around 6.30 and waited there until almost 8. Nothing. The neighbor came out asking what was wrong. I sent him there since I inquired about a kitten and she said, A kitten? Yes, it was an ad on Craigslist. She said, No one has kittens in this home though. I showed her the ad and she said, Oh, I know them. They are very sketchy people and they don't own any cats. I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. Well, the ad said that they had to get rid of their kittens since their new place doesn't allow pets. And the neighbor replied with, That's impossible. I have a dog and so does the next door over. I immediately found this creepy and I was feeling anxious. I thanked her and left along with my fiance. Literally immediately when we pulled out of the street, I got a text from the girl saying, I just got your messages. Something must be wrong with my phone. Did you still need a kitten or no? I didn't answer and we just headed back home. What I don't understand is, they didn't get any money from me, but they asked me to show up not knowing that I'd be with my fiance. I have a bad feeling about this. What did they want from me? I'm a female. When I was 19, I was looking for a room to rent in the city I was moving to for college. It was about an hour away from my family. I wasn't having much luck and my mom started helping me look for a place. She found an ad on Craigslist for a room to rent, which was in a house, everything included. The homeowner was a man and he rented the additional rooms to other women while he lived in the finished basement. The ad stated that he rarely ever saw the other roommates because he had a kitchen and his own entrance downstairs and that he preferred women because he's had issues with men roommates in the past, partying and causing damage. We decided to take a look since it was the cheapest that we could find in the area. My mom and I went to the house to view it. Decent home, decent neighborhood. He opened the door and was very welcoming. He was middle aged and the kitchen and living room were furnished nicely and clean. My mom likes to talk and get to know people, so they engaged in conversation while I stood there quietly and observed the place. He then said he would show me my room. We headed to the staircase to go up, as I thought, since he said on the phone that my room would be upstairs with the other roommates. But he opens another door and we follow. He takes us down to the basement and opens the doorway to a very small room. No closet, no windows. He proceeds to say that this is my room and I would be sharing a bathroom in the hallway with him, and that his bathroom did not have a door on it. I was definitely thinking absolutely not, and that this is weird, but they were so deep in conversation that I couldn't interject. He then leads us upstairs and shows us the other rooms, which the doors were open, and says that they're currently rented. He starts telling us elaborate stories about the other women, not very nice stories, describing drinking problems. My mom was listening intently, 
but I took the time to investigate further. I looked in all three of the rooms and bedrooms. There was furniture, but not a single item in there looked like it belonged to a woman. No clothes or anything, only men's clothes in one of the closets. He had no problem with me creeping around the tenants' rooms without their permission. I then heard him tell my mom that he has some of his stuff in their closets, but they don't mind. And I'm just like, hmm, why the hell would a tenant pay for you to use their space as a storage? I was feeling really uncomfortable and started moving them back downstairs as they talked. My mom had mentioned when we arrived that her and my dad were going on vacation next week, but I couldn't because I had to work. He brought it up again and that I should come over next week and have dinner with him and the roomies. That way we could see if we all get along. I said sure and we left. As soon as we get in the car, I told my mom I would definitely not be moving there. She looked dumbfounded. I had to explain to her that not only did he lie about the room I would be in, and that I was not supposed to be in the basement with him, as well as share a bathroom with him that didn't even have a damn door, but she also didn't notice that no one else lived there. She still didn't get it and thought I was just being paranoid. She legitly thought he was nice and it was a cheap deal. I had to explain it to my stepdad and had to get him to tell her that by no means would I be living there. I tried to report the post, but by the time we got home that day, he had removed it. I think he planned on murdering me at this dinner or abducting me and holding me hostage in that basement room with no way to escape. Edit. Some details have been coming back to me since I've been answering all of your questions. This happened in 2001, so it's been quite a while. When he took us upstairs, there was a wide landing that was surrounded by the rooms. He would start this long, intricate story about the women who lived there and talking about her alcoholism and a crazy ex. He was very exaggerated in how he talked with a lot of gestures. My mom stood there and listened to him. I don't know if it was sheer distraction or she didn't want to be rude by not listening. But either way, I don't recall her ever having a good look around those rooms. I went and looked. All the doors were open, had neatly made beds with dark wood frames, with a nightstand and a mirror. There were sliding mirror closets and they were empty, except for the one that had the male clothes hanging in it. Nothing was on the nightstand other than the lamp. I went into the bathrooms and there was nothing on the vanity or in the vanity other than some soap. I looked in the showers too, but nothing other than a bar of soap. The bedroom on the left had an empty suitcase laying open on the middle of the bed. This was one of the rooms with the empty closet. After seeing all this, I came back onto the landing and started slowly heading downstairs. They were still talking and absentmindedly followed me down to the living room. That's when he mentioned the dinner and we left shortly after. I think that's why my mom didn't notice a lot and didn't believe me at first. She didn't take more than a quick glance upstairs, and when we were in the basement, he was just as talkative. A commenter who works for law enforcement pointed out that this was probably a sex trafficking situation. The bedroom in the basement is where the victim is kept, drugged and abused until they're broken, and then trafficked. I honestly think this is more plausible with the situation, as well as the city is actually a hotspot for that. I'm so grateful we got out of there and hope my experience can help someone one day notice the details and get out of a situation safely. Stay safe and bless people. There is this guy named David who inboxed me on Facebook one day and we started chatting throughout the week. He was being flirtatious with me at first, but I shut that down and let him know that he wasn't getting anything of that nature. Within the same week, he was asking to meet up once he found out that we stayed not too far from each other. And this became a consistent thing. I dodged the question every time he asked. Throughout texting for like six months, he told me about his life trauma and past relationships. And one day, he stopped getting on Facebook for a while. Then he popped back up, texting me from a different phone number, saying that he was in jail, but he never told me why. He told me that he was going to change his life around for his kids and stop being a bad boy. We texted throughout that month, like usual, but then kind of fell off as he went ghost on Facebook. 
I later found out that he was back in jail. One day, I decided to look up his mugshot, and he had several charges going back to 2013, which included a couple of burglary charges, and pretty much everything but murder. Be careful who you meet online, whether you're dating or it's just a friendship. A few years ago, I moved with my family right before I started college. Unfortunately, it was kind of far away from the university I had been accepted to, so I had been trying to find a place to rent that was closer to my university. My dad helped me and showed me an ad on Craigslist. There was a nice looking house for rent and it was close to my university. I decided to set up a meeting and go check out the place. I showed up in the afternoon and unfortunately I was alone. My dad said I was an adult and a big guy, so I shouldn't have to worry about meeting this person. This older guy greeted me and then goes, you have to follow me to the house that's for rent. I was confused and said, your dad said that this was the house for rent. Why do I have to go somewhere else? He replied with, this is my house. I'll take you to the one that's for rent. I'm a little concerned at this point and followed him to the other place. I figured if things didn't look right, I'll just leave. We get there and I noticed the house looks bad and it looked like there were people in it. I didn't see any other cars around, so this seemed odd. He looks at me and says, don't you want to go check it out? I said, I don't know, this isn't what was in your ad and it looks like other people are in there. He tells me that other people are checking it out and I could join them. Something just felt weird about the whole thing, and I told him I wasn't interested anymore. This place looked in bad shape from the outside, and appeared to have people in the house. When he asked why I wasn't interested, I told him that it was too far of a drive for school and work. He got mad at me, and accused me of wasting his time. I replied with, I'm not the one that's advertising the house, and then telling a person that it's not the one for rent. He began to glance nervously towards the house and asked if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. I told him no one left. He never contacted me again, thankfully. I'm not sure what his intentions were, but something just felt wrong. Maybe he was just trying to show me the house, but I didn't like how he lied about the house to begin with and that there were people inside the house. I'm not sure what was going on there, but I didn't really want to find out. I also didn't like how he kept looking at the house when he was asking me if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. It seemed so bizarre how he went from being mad at me to getting kind of desperate for me to go inside. I have no idea where to post this, but I wanted to share what just happened. I tried FaceTiming with my best friend and someone answered it, but it wasn't my friend. I hadn't realized it wasn't her, so I stayed on the call as the camera was facing up the wall and ceiling. The person on the other end didn't say anything, so I began talking. That's when I noticed the purple wall. I had never seen a purple wall at her house. Suddenly the camera flipped and they hung up. I was freaked out because it wasn't something that my friend would do, since she doesn't answer calls unless she can stay on and talk with them. Confused, I text her asking if I called her, since I thought I could have called a wrong number. She said she didn't answer any call. Then I sent her a screenshot of my recent calls, and then when she checked, it did show that she answered a FaceTime at the same time. Moments later, I called her again through the message app, and she answered. I asked her if she painted her walls purple, but she had no idea what I was talking about. That's when I explained everything to her, and we all started freaking out. Update. Luckily, with the help of the comments, we figured out what happened. Once we checked the call information from her phone, it said that the FaceTime was answered by another device. She checked her Apple ID info and saw that another device was logged in that she didn't know. Quickly, she changed her password, and seconds later, she got a notification that someone in a different state was trying to log into her account. Still creepy to think that this person had access to everything in her iCloud information for who knows how long. 